what up, what up? If you are watching this, you are beginning unit one of AP Pre-Calculus. We're going to go through these four sections. So uh, let's learn a few things and let's practice a few problems and see how long this takes. Probably about an hour, give or take. This is a periodic function. A periodic function is basically something that repeats a cycle over a certain amount of time. Now, when you're looking at a periodic function, just from a graphical point of view, you're looking at a few things. You are looking at for A, its period, which means how long does it take to complete a cycle? Okay, so the period is basically going to be the distance from this X value to that X value. Another thing that we'll care about is the amplitude. The amplitude is not the very tippy top to the very bottom, but the very tippy top minus the very bottom, which gives you the total distance, but divide that by two. So the amplitude is going to be half the distance from the top to the bottom, whatever that distance is. Periodic functions repeat themselves. So a lot of problems are gonna be like, hey, look at this guy, but give me an answer of something down the road and part of the graph that you can't see. We'll deal with that when we have to deal with that. That's a periodic function. Okay, the most basic kinds of periodic functions are sine and cosine. Now, before we get into anything different, let's look at the most basic version of sine and cosine that you may have learned back in the day. You probably remember SOHCAHTOA. And what SOHCAHTOA meant back then was sine of an angle meant its opposite over its hypotenuse and the co part of SOHCAHTOA meant the cosine of an angle equals the adjacent side over the hypotenuse. Now, when we look at this picture right here, the sine of my angle is going to equal the opposite over R. We're going to look at sine in two different ways, and we're going to look at cosine in two different ways. Way number one is what if you're dealing with something called the unit circle? What if you're dealing with the unit circle? The unit circle is when R is equal to one. Otherwise, we'll deal with everything else. So uh, the old E, E, everything else. Now, when you have the unit circle and R is equal to one, sine of theta is going to equal Y, its opposite side over its hypotenuse R. So sine theta, equals y over r, which is y over 1, which is y. So sine theta is just the y value. Oh, well, how nice. I wonder if cosine will give us something similar. I don't know. Let's get a different color and find out. Cosine is the adjacent side over the hypotenuse. So cos theta is going to equal the adjacent side, which is x, over the hypotenuse, which is r. But r is 1. So x over 1 is x. So cosine theta is equal to just the x value. So good news. If I give you the unit circle and you know r is equal to 1, you have an x and a y value of cos x or cos theta sine theta. Your x value is cos theta and your y value is sine theta. Oh, how nice. Well, what about these everything else problems that we were talking about over here where r is just some number that we don't know about? Well, if r is just some number we don't know about, then sine theta is just going to equal y over r. If I want to kind of recreate this guy over here and I multiply r to both sides, that gives me r sine theta equals y. Oh. And as we probably are going to figure out, if r sine theta equals y, I could do the same thing with cos theta. Cos theta is going to be x over r. And if I multiply both sides by r, then r cos theta is my x value. So when I give you problems where the radius is not one, I could use this point here. So very often, very often, we will be given problems that have to do with coordinates. Sometimes the radius is one, sometimes it's not. 
And if the radius is one, we will refer to the X as our cos theta, the Y as our sine theta. And if the R is not one, then we will refer to the X coordinate as R cos theta and the Y coordinate as R sine theta. So that's basically the basic definition of what sine and cosine means from a circular triangular point of view. Now, speaking of unit circle, there she is. Probably the most important thing that you could possibly learn in pre-calculus is the unit circle. Let's start off very basic. The unit circle assumes that R is one. Thank you, Jesus. Now, if R is one, that gives us the point right here of one, zero. That gives us the point right here of zero, one. That gives us the point right here of negative one, zero. And that gives us the point right here of zero, negative one. Now, with the unit circle, we have measurements that we care about. We know that an angle is measured starting from the right and working our way counterclockwise, okay? An entire circle in radians is two pi. So you are zero radians. If the whole circle is two pi radians, that means half the circle is regular pi. And half of half a circle is pi over two. And three quarters of two pi is going to be three pi over two. Now we also need to come up with these guys. You are one third of my way to pi over two. You are half of my way to pi over two. And you are two thirds of my way to pi over two. So this angle right here, uh, multiply one third to pi over two gives you pi over six. Okay, pi over six. Multiply one half to pi over two, and you have pi over four. And multiply two thirds to pi over two, and you have pi over three. Okay, this is going to be very much the same thing. Okay, we are at at pi over two and we're making our way to pi. So one third of our way between pi over two to pi is two pi over three. Halfway in between pi over two and pi is going to be three quarters pi. And two thirds of our way from pi over two to pi is going to be five pi over six. Now we're at pi, and the easy way of figuring these guys out is just add pi to all six of them, okay? Add pi, so add six over six, or add, yeah, add six over six to that, that gets us seven pi over six. Add pi to that, that's five pi over four. Add one to that, you get four pi over three. Add a whole pi to that, and you get, what is that, 5 pi over 3. Okay, add 4 pi over 4 to that, you get 7 pi over 4. And add 6 pi over 6 to this, and you get 11 pi over 6. All right, so there's our angle measures. Probably my least favorite part. Okay, now the rest of it is coming up with the actual coordinates. Now, when we deal with coordinates, we always think of it like this way. Think of it as the square root of something over two. The square root of something over two. Starting from the x-axis and working your way up, you're gonna start with three. So root three over two, root two over two, root one over two, and that's gonna be your x value. So this is going to be root three over two. This is going to be root two over two. And this is going to be root one over two, but the square root of one is just one, so one over two. How do I figure out the y values? Do the same thing in reverse. Root three over two, root two over two, root one, which is one over two. And now I make my way around, keeping in mind that I'm now in different quadrants, okay? These guys are the, basically the same exact distance and the same exact y value. So you 
are going to be negative one half because it's a negative x value, but my y value stays the same. Okay, you line up with that. So the negative x value, because we're in quadrant two, root two over two, root two over two. Okay, and now you are negative root three over two, which makes sense because you're closest to the x axis and you are one half. Okay, these guys match up with those guys. Similarly, these guys match up. But now I'm in the third quadrant, which means both my x and my y are negative. So you are going to be negative root 3 over 2. The x value does not change, but the y value is now negative 1 over 2. You are basically the same as that, which is negative root 2 over 2, but also negative root 2 over 2 because we're in the third quadrant, which everything is negative. You line up with that, so negative a half, negative root 3 over 2. Negative root 3 over 2. Don't want to forget that. To complete this process, you guys line up with that, but now we have positive x's again, so you are one half negative root three over two. You are positive root two over two, negative root two over two, quadrant four is positive negative, and you are uh, root three over two, negative one half. That's the unit circle. It's a mess, but it's useful. It's very useful. All right. Sine and cosine graphs. We're just going to basically draw out the very basic forms of the sine and cosine graph. Let's start out with sine. Again, everything's periodic. Sine starts out at zero, one. Okay. Stein starts out at zero, one, and it peaks out at regular one, bottoms out at negative one, and has a period of two pi. So it's going to start down here, it's going to peak out, and then bottom out at regular pi, which means it's going to peak out at half a pi. When it comes back down here, it bottoms out at three pi over two, and then comes back up and hits the x-axis again at 2 pi. Okay, so attempting to draw these is never a good idea for me, but I'm going to give it my best shot. Start out at 0, 0, peak out at 1, come back down to pi, come back down to negative 1, and then come up to 2 pi. Get what you pay for when you watch my videos. But that's what sine x looks like. That's what sine x looks like. Cosine has very, very, very similar behaviors, but this guy starts out at 0, 1. Okay, so you start out at 0, 1, and you bottom out at negative 1 eventually. But we don't bottom out yet. We start out at 0, 1. We hit the x-axis at pi over 2. We bottom out at pi, we come back out and hit the x-axis again at 3 pi over 2, and then we complete its period process at 2 pi. Okay, so drawing this guy out, we start out at 0, 1. We hit the x-axis at pi over 2. I missed it. I missed it. I missed it. See, now no one will ever know. Uh, bottom out at negative 1 at pi. Hit the x-axis again at 3 pi over 2 and then repeat the process at 2 pi. So that's the difference between sine x and cosine x, okay? So we're gonna need to keep th these in mind as we answer a buttload of problems that are coming our way starting now. All right, oh yeah, oops, tangent. What is tangent? We might see tangent once or twice. Tangent is literally whatever sine is, divided by cosine is, that is the tangent value. You don't see tangent a ton until the second half of unit two, but you will probably see a teensy, teensy, teensy bit of tangent uh, every now and then. So 
tangent is just sine divided by cosine. Tangent is just sine divided by cosine. Tangent is just sine divided by cosine. Let's move my face. Now we're starting right off the bat with a periodic graph, as you can see right there. Right away, I ask you what the period is, which means if I were to pick like a spot, like right there, how long will it take me to get to the same exact spot? Well, here. So this peak occurs at seven and then reoccurs again at 15. So if you're wondering what is the period, you do 15 minus seven, which is eight. Okay, that's the period. How long it takes to complete a cycle and this cycle takes eight units to do just that. What is the amplitude? Okay, well, the amplitude is the very, very, very tippy top to the very, very, very bottom, but divide that by two. Okay, so the very tippy top is five. The very bottom is one. So the length from top to bottom is five minus one, but you're going to divide that by two. And four divided by two last time I checked is two. Now we need to plug in 41. Well, I don't have 41, but this is what I know. This is what I know. I know my period is eight, okay? So whatever happens at one can be found by doing this, eight divided by 41, okay? Uh, or 41 technically divided by eight. That goes into a five times, that's 40. Remainder of one. Now, why is that important? Your remainder is telling you that 41 behaves in the same exact way as regular one. At regular one, when X is regular one, I'm at three. So F of one is three, which means F of 41 behaves the same exact way because if I were to cut this guy and move it over a bunch of times, we will end up with uh, that guy right there. And we can kind of see that because this ends at 20, so if I were to bump this over again and then shift it over one more, we can see that one right there. So this kind of does work out looking at it graphically if I want to look at it graphically. But that's how you find out if you can't look at it graphically. I can't extend that graph anymore because I'm out of space. I just can't do it. It's like my NASA hat. I'm out of space. <laughs> oh, oh, man. Let's move my face again. All right. Given an interval for the measure of alpha. Who? what are we talking about? Me? I'm not alpha. The measure of alpha is, oh, this whole angle right there. They want me to find sine alpha. They want me to find cos alpha. And they want me to find tan alpha. Ooh, this is the unit circle. How do I know that? Well, because the radius is one. So if I'm using the unit circle, I can use the fact that cos, in this case, alpha, is my x, sine, in this case, alpha, is my y. I have a point of 0 0.6, negative 0 0.8. So my sine alpha is just my y value. And my y value is just negative 0 0.8. So sine alpha is just negative 0 0.8. Similarly, cos alpha is just my x value. And my x value is just 0 0.6. Now to find tangent, we do sine divided by cosine. So tangent is going to be negative uh, 0 0.8 divided by 0 0.6. So that's the same thing as basically saying 8 over 6, which is 1.2. No, 1.3 repeating. So my tangent is going to be negative 1.3 repeating or negative 1 and a third. Okay?
So when I give you the unit circle and I ask you to find sine and cosine and you're given points, all you have to do is just relate the sine and cosine to the points that you're given. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. Oh, but what if it's not the unit circle? Arr. Well, let's see what we got. This next one, we don't have the unit circle. The radius is three. How do I know that? Well, if this point goes over to three, zero, that means the radius is three. Don't overthink it. And when the radius is three, that means my X value is now radius cos theta. And my Y value is radius sine theta. Okay, that's my X. That's my Y. I'm also given this point down here that I care about where theta travels all the way over here. And so the point that I have is negative 1.1 negative 2.791. So I kind of wish I made this a calculator problem, but I'll use Siri for it because the numbers are miserable. It's not like I need to do like the sign of a number or anything wacky like that. My job is to find sine theta. Well, I know from this information over here, two things. I know R cos theta equals X which means if I divide both sides by R, cos theta equals X over R, just kind of like what we saw in that second or third slide when we began this video. Similarly, and this is what matters here, is that my sine theta is going to be R sine theta equals my Y. And if I'm being asked to find sine theta, I'm going to calculate whatever my Y is over my R. So sine theta is whatever my Y is, which is negative 2.791 over R, which is three. So negative 2.791 divided by three. The answer is approximately negative 0.9303. 9303. Three. So we'll leave that as that. Okay. So probably should have used a, uh, uh, a calculator, but it's too late now. Uh, cosine is found by doing X over R. So cosine theta is my X value, which is negative 1.1 divided by three. Negative 1.1 divided by three. The answer is approximately negative 0 0.3666. Oof, I don't like that. I don't like that. But thankfully for rounding, we don't have to be in fear. Okay, so there's my cos theta. And tan theta is basically the same thing as u divided by u. So negative 0 0.930 divided by negative 0 0.967. So negative 0 0.930 divided by negative 0 0.367. It's going to be positive. It's approximately 2.534. 2.534. I like it. I like it. I like it a lot. All right. Now we are being asked to find the ratio of each expression. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use that unit circle that we so eloquently did uh, a little while back. I'm going to try to draw that. Holy cow, that looks awful. I'm keeping it. I'm keeping it. All right. And what we're going to do is we're going to label the points based off the angle measurements that I give you. Now, reminder that cos theta is our x value sine theta is our y value. So when we look at these, we are thinking, oh, y thoughts, oh, x thoughts, blah, 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 blah. Now, three pi over four. If you remember, here was zero, here was pi. No, it wasn't, that's half a pi. Here was pi, and here was three pi over two. 3 pi over 4 is literally that center spot right there. Okay, 3 pi over 4 was that center spot right there. That gave us a point of 
root two over two and root two over two because that's how the center spots work. In this case, the X value is negative because we're in quadrant two. I am asking you to find the sine of three pi over four, which means I care about the Y value. So the sine of three pi over four is the Y value created by that angle, which gives us the Y coordinate root two over two. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All right, on to the next one. Cosine of three pi over two. Three pi over two is a little bit after pi. And if you remember that three pi over two is actually right here, there it is. So right there. So that point right there is actually the point zero, negative one. I want the cosine of it, which is the X value. So the cosine of three pi over two is the X coordinate of zero, negative one, which is zero. How about that? Catch me outside. How about that? Remember her? Bad baby. All right. Sine of 11 pi over 6. That is just before 2 pi. And if you remember, there's three dots here. That's the third dot. Okay. Whenever you are coming up with your numbers, when I'm thinking about this, I always think when you start from the x axis, your x value is going to be that root 3 over 2. And then your Y value is going to be the opposite number, which is one in this case. Now, since this is quadrant four, Y is negative. I'm asking you to find the sine of 11 pi over six, which means I need the Y value, which ends up being negative one half. Okay. Last but not least, cos four pi over three. Oh, yeah. 4 pi over 3 is in between here and here, and that would be the third dot, the third dot of this guy, okay? Now, the third dot of this guy, if we're thinking x values, that's root 3 over 2, root 2 over 2. That is root 1 over 2, so 1 over 2. And then the other one is root 3 over 2. x and y are both negative, so cosine wants you to find the x value, and the x value is negative one half in this case. All right, so that's how you use the unit circle to come up with values or ratios and stuff like that if you're given a bunch of ratios, which I am. All right, the measure of angle COD is 2 pi over 3 radians. So you are 2 pi over 3 which brings you to the first dot of the three dots there. Okay, so C is going to be the first dot. Find the coordinates of C. Here's issue number one. The coordinates of C are not as simple as me saying, oh, well, this is a unit circle. It is a unit circle, but the radius is now four. So I have to treat this as R cos theta, R sine theta. Now, if this was the unit circle, since that is the first dot of three, that gives me negative a half regular root three over two. Negative positive because it's the second quadrant. However, that's not exactly what I'm doing here. If this was the unit circle, cos theta would be negative a half and sine theta would be root three over two. My R here is four. So I'm going to do four times negative one half r, which is four again, times root three over two. So that gives me negative two and two root three over two. No, two root three, sorry, two root three. Manageable, manageable. B is halfway in between A and C. All right, so if B is halfway in between A and C, that gives you the angle 5 pi over 6. You're my third dot. Find the coordinates of B. All right, well, if you're my third dot, that means you are literally the flip version of that. So root 3 over 2, uh, negative, and then 1 half. 
However, I need to multiply those guys by four. So basically, it's very, very, very similar to what we see up here. Four times negative root three over two, four times a half is going to give me negative two root three, two. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let B be the coordinate negative five root two and regular five root two. Find the measure of an angle rotated counterclockwise from the positive X axis to B. All right, okay, so obviously we don't have a unit circle because what this is supposed to be is first things first, points are supposed to be something over two. So I have an idea. Let me take this point and multiply this by two over two. So I have negative, so if I multiply u by two over two and I multiply u by two over two, that looks a little bit more familiar. Okay, so that would be negative 10 root two over two and u would be regular 10 root two over two. Now, since this isn't the unit circle, I'm comparing this to r cos theta and your r sine theta, okay? So what basically this is telling me is this is telling me right here that my, like, and let's focus on the sign first because the negative might be a bit confusing and you might look at this and be like, whoa, 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 what did you just do? Root two over two, I know what that is. I, I, I've, I've seen root two over two all over the unit circle. So if I just focused on the fact that sine theta is root two over two, that leaves me with a radius of 10. So similarly over here, since this is negative, I can't have a negative radius. So I'll just pretend that the radius is 10 and the cosine is negative root two over two. So I don't have, I'm not asking you to find the radius, but the radius is 10. However, this is now saying cos theta is root two over two, okay, in its negative form, and sine theta is root two over two. So when that happens, that point, and of course this is not drawn the scale, but that point is that direct midpoint between these two guys. So I have three dots, B is the middle dot, which makes this three pi over four. So you are three pi over four. What is the distance from zero to B? Ah, that's my radius. My radius is 10, figured it out already. What is the distance from A to B if the distance is vertical? Okay, so you are literally on top of the other. Okay, so if you are a Y value, right? If the distance here is a Y value, then you are root two over two. If this is the same exact guy as that, then you are also a value of root two over two. And so I have root two over two plus root two over two, which is root two times two over two, which is root two. Did you catch that? Very exciting. Very exciting. Very exciting stuff. I hate this problem. Oh boy, I hate this problem. But they, I've seen this problem all over like AP classroom and stuff like that. So I'm assuming it might show up somewhere. I don't know. Who knows? We're going to do it. We are given an angle theta in standard position as shown in the figure below. So boom, here's my theta. The function g is given by g of a equals sine a. So this is a sine value uh, for the angle alpha not shown. Theta is smaller than alpha, and alpha is in between theta and 2 pi. So here's 2 pi. Here's theta. Alpha is somewhere over here. Okay? Alpha is that area over here. I don't know exactly what it is, 
but it's that area over there. I need to figure out what happens if I plug in alpha and theta. So let's view this from graphing the sine function point of view. I care about the sine function from zero to two pi. Sine starts at zero, zero, peaks out at one, bottoms out at negative one. Uh, it hits the x-axis again at regular pi. It uh, repeats itself at two pi, which means it peaks out at half a pi and it bottoms out at three pi over two. All right, so let me attempt to draw this out, which I'm always bad at. Let me attempt to draw this out, which I'm always bad at. Not too bad if I say so myself. Now theta is basically anything from zero all the way and beyond three pi over two. So theta could be anything from here to like here. Could be theta. So this new guy, alpha, is going to be between here and here. So whatever I plug in for theta, whatever I plug in for theta, okay, I could plug in, well, theta is right here. So if I plug in theta, I, I get some number. If I plug in theta, I get like negative something. Okay, so G of theta is like negative, like 0.8 or something. Whatever I plug in for alpha, it's going to be to the right of it, which means it's going to be bigger than whatever I plug in for theta, no matter what. So G of alpha is going to be greater than G of theta because anything to the right of theta, no matter what, is going to be higher. So I hope I explained it well. I feel like I didn't. But um, I don't know. It's just a weird problem. But I've seen, like, there's three problems on AP Classroom like this. Like, when you, as a teacher, when you assign homeworks, there's three that look just like this and the other three don't. So, like, they clearly AP Classroom likes this type of problem. So, I don't know. Will it show up on an exam? Who knows? But don't be surprised if it don't. All right. <clears throat> F of X equals cos X. Let's just draw it out. F of X equals regular old cosine x. Okay, cosine starts at one, okay, hits at uh, half a pi, bottoms out at pi, uh, comes back up, hits again at three pi over two, and repeats itself at two pi. Okay, that's what cosine looks like. Gross. Where is f of x, cos x, concave up on the interval 0 to pi? Concave up look like this. So this happens here. So this is concave down. Then the switch of concavity happens right at pi over 2. Concave up, concave up, concave up. And then the change of concavity happens at 3 pi over 2. Now, at pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2, it's neither concave up nor concave down. So we will say that this is concave up on pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2. When does f of x cos x equal 1? I'm not given an interval. This is a periodic function, which means it hits 1 at 0. It hits 1 at 2 pi, so it'll hit 1 at 4 pi and 6 pi, and if I go backwards, negative 2 pi. So basically, I can word it out like this. Basically, every 2 pi is when it hits 1, okay? So we will say 2k, right? 2k pi, where k is n integer. Okay, so if I plug in zero, I get zero, which is an answer. 
if I plug in, and by the way, I should say X equals make it look better. Uh, if I plug in one, two times one is two, two pi is another answer. Okay, if I plug in two, two times two is four, four pi is another answer, this will work. If I plug in negative one, I get negative two pi, that'll work, boom. Is f of x an even function? Cosine x is an even function, and here's why. Two reasons. It starts up here, looks like this. It has reason number one, reflectional symmetry over the y-axis. Whatever happens on the right side of the y-axis, the exact mirror image happens on the left side. It has reflectional symmetry. The other reason why is if I were to plug in f of x, or rather plug in negative x, I would get f of x. Okay, so yes, for the two reasons that even functions are even functions reflectional symmetry over the x-axis, and also because f of negative x, if I were to plug in negative x, I would get the same exact value as if I were to plug in regular x. Like if I were to plug in 2 pi, I get 1. If I were to plug in negative 2 pi, I get 1. Okay, and the same thing will always happen left and right. So yes, f of x cosine x is an even function. Hmm. Ah, oh, let's take a look at sine, sine theta. So we kind of looked at sine. Let's draw it again because it's good for you, even though I'm the one drawing it. Uh, starts at zero, zero, peaks out at one, bottoms out at negative one. Uh, it repeats itself every two pi times. Okay, so it's going to go up here at half a pi. It's going to peak out at regular pi. It's going to hit the x-axis at three pi over two. It's going to bottom out at 2 pi. It repeats the process. Okay, so starts at 0, 0, peak, hit, bottom, hit, repeat. Okay, where is the rate of change of g of theta decreasing on 0, 4 pi? Oh, it's making me think a little bit. First off, rate of change decreasing, what does that mean? concave down. Rate of change decreasing means concave down. This is going to be concave down here from zero to pi over just regular pi, just regular pi, regular pi, regular pi, regular, regular, regular pi. Now that is when it's from zero to two pi. It's now concave up, but when it repeats itself from 2 pi to 3 pi, it's going to be concave down again. So we must include those, 2 pi to 3 pi. Don't include them because they're neither concave up nor concave down because those are inflection points. <gasps> what did I just say? Inflection points? I did just say inflection points. You're an inflection point. You're an inflection point. You're an inflection point. So it looks like inflection points happen at zero and pi and two pi. Inflection points are going to be the x values that happen at every k pi, where k is an integer. There you go. Now I can spell. That makes sense. Uh, one pi, yep. Two pi, yep. 3 pi, yup. 0 pi, 0, yup. Negative 1 pi, yup. Pumpkin pie? <laughs> just kidding. Okay, just kidding. What is the period of g theta? Come on. I think we know that by now. All right. Oh, this is not a calculator problem. Okay, no calculators yet. Uh, let h of x equal sine x and j of x equals cos x. Where on 0, 2 pi do h of x and j of x have the same concavity? So let me move my face over here because I'm going to need to draw both of these guys on the same coordinate plane. This should be a lot of fun. All right. 
obviously, we know the magic numbers. We have pi. We have 2 pi. We also know the magic numbers of 1 and negative 1. Okay. Uh, sine x, I'm going to let u be red. Sine x starts at 0, 0, peaks out, hits the x-axis again, bottoms out, and then repeats. I'm going to let cosine equal blue. Cosine starts here, uh, works its way down, bottoms out at negative 1, crosses, and then repeats. Okay. This is going to be interesting. I want the same concavity. All right. The red is concave down between 0 and pi and concave up between pi and 2 pi. Blue is concave down between 0 and half a pi, and then between half a pi and 3 pi over 2 is concave up, and then concave down again for the rest. So both of these are concave down, so I'll say that, I'll be specific, concave down on the interval 0 and pi over 2, and both of these are concave up on the interval pi to 3 pi over 2. gross. Where is h of x red greater than j of x? I can't do that without a calculator. I can't do that without a calculator. So is that... I wonder if uh, that I should have started calculator time there. I mean, I, I created these problems. I should have just started calculator time there. So this is what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to take a little side. Uh, let's look at this problem. This is a calculator problem. You can't do this without. There's no way. Um, this is a calculator problem. So uh, it's basically going to happen where, what do I want? I want where red is greater than blue. So it happens between the intersection right here and the intersection right there. So what I need to do is I need to find out those two intersections and I'll answer it that way. All right, uh, y equals, well, first off, let's make sure your mode is set to radians. It should be, it is. Uh, y equals sine x and cos x like that. Uh, I'm going to go to zoom and make it zoom trig because that makes it all triggy. So there's my guys. Uh, I wanted to find out this intersection point right here and this intersection point right there because the one that I wanted was greater at those moments. So I need that intersection point. So let's go to calc, second trace, click five intersect. And, um, oh, it's going to intersect forever. So I'm going to hit enter. I'm going to make sure that I give it an interval. Otherwise, it's going to fall apart on me. And by giving it an interval, it gives me one intersection point of 0 0.7053, blah, 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 blah. So the x value is going to be 0 0.7, what is that, 85 or 05? That's an 8, 785. Okay? No, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. All right, so we need to find the other intersection. Second, calc, intersect. And let's make sure we go over here. Let's make sure we go over here and give it an interval because we have a bunch of intersection points. Otherwise, it's not going to know what we want. So there's the interval. Okay, so everything in between that. And that guy gives me 3.9269, so 3.927 
is going to be uh, my interval. So let's go back and write that out. All right, so when we did that, <coughs> this guy right here ended up being point, uh, 0.785 is what I wrote down over here. That guy ended up being point 0.3927. No, 3.927. So definitely you need a calculator for that one. Not as uh, not as simple as one would hope. Although, there's other ways that you can do that, but uh, we're not there yet. All right, I digress. Uh, C, where on the interval zero to pi is H equal to 0 0.75? So I'm dealing with sine and I need to graph 0 0.75 and see where my sine curve is going to uh, cross 0 0.75. So I need an intersection there and an intersection there. So let's see what happens. All right, so now we are being asked where h of x, where h of x is 0 0.75. So the h of x was the sine. So let's pretend that the cosine's not there. And we can do that by going to the equal sign. And now this it's gone. Okay, so only sine shows up. I care when it's equal to 0 0.75 on the interval 0 to pi. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to graph 0 0.75. Let's see. So here's 0. Okay, here's pi. Here's 2 pi. It looks like it hits twice. So I need to find both of those intersection points, both of those x values. So I need the intersect. Second, calc, 5. And I'm going to make sure I'm very clear that I choose the interval between that guy and that guy so that it gives me what I want. So that actually gave me the one I didn't want. That gave me the second one, 2.293. So that's going to be my second one. Don't know why it did that. 2.294. So that's the second one. I'm a little nervous. But we'll see what happens. Second, calc. Intersect again. Let's move to the left of it. Enter. Move to the right, maybe not too much. Enter, enter. Ah, and it worked at that time. 0 0.848. 0 0.848. So that's my other guy. Okay, that happened at two spots. 0 0.848 and 2.294. Mm. Find the average rate of change of j of x, so now we're on cos, j of x on the interval uh, a quarter of a pi and 3.75 pi. All right, so rate of change, average rate of change is f of b minus f of a over b minus a. So what I'm going to need to type out in my calculator is, what am I doing? J, which is cos, cos of, remember, you're my a, you're my b, cos of 3.75 pi minus cos of 0 0.25 pi all over 3.75 uh, pi minus 0 0.25 pi. Well, you're not going to get a pleasant answer. Or are we? All right, so this is how I'm going to handle this one. I'm just going to type this all in in one foul swoop that you saw me write down a minute ago. Cosine and parentheses, of course. Don't forget your parentheses when you have a numerator. Uh, 3.75 pi is second caret thingy, close the parentheses, minus cosine again of 0 0.25 pi, close it, close it. Now I'm going to divide parentheses 3.75 pi, so 3.75. 75 pi minus 0 0.25 pi. 
second thing. Close it and see what terrible number that I get. Well, zero. Now I get zero. And if you're like, that's not zero, uh, e to the negative 14 is zero. So let's, let's write that out and let's go back to our Google side and see if we can figure out why. We got zero. Why? Well, here's the thing. Cosine look like this. Cosine look like this. And we're going all the way out to 4 pi. So let's go all the way out to 4 pi. All right. So cosine starts up here. Okay. There's 2 pi. And there's 4 pi. Okay. A quarter after, a quarter of a pi after my initial beginning, I'm like right here. A quarter pi before four pi, I'm at the same exact level. The same exact level. Which means if I'm like whatever number that is, uh, which is point something, point nine, I end up at 0.9 after who cares of amount of time. I haven't changed anything. I haven't changed at all. The average rate of change of a horizontal uh, line is nothing. Isn't that fun? Isn't that weird? Isn't that something else? I don't know. I didn't think it's nice. It's not like I did that on purpose. Uh, thank you guys for watching. Um, a couple more of these and then we'll be done AP pre-calculus. So. Uh, I appreciate everybody liking and, and all the comments. So please don't stop that anytime soon. It, uh, it's, it's fun to see my YouTube grow just a little bit. So keep that going, please. Thank you so much. I love you all. Thanks for watching. Bye. Let's talk about sinusoidal functions in AP pre-calculus. You can't spell fun without sinusoidal functions. Let's start out with the most basic form of a sinusoidal function. I'm actually going to rewrite that. I stole this picture from the internet and upon further review, I don't like it anymore. The most basic form of a sinusoidal function is y or f of x equals a sine parentheses b, another parentheses x minus c, close it, close it, plus d. Now there's obviously four letters that matter in this case. A is the amplitude. Okay, now let me just draw out some random sinusoidal function looks something like that. That's what a sinusoidal function is. A stands for the amplitude. A lot of people think the amplitude is the distance from the tippy top to the very bottom. That's not true. It's half the distance from the tippy top to the very bottom. That is called the amplitude. Period is where things repeat itself. So if I were to go to the tippy top here, and measure how long it takes to get from this tippy top to that tippy top, that gets me my period. Now, B is not my period. B is my frequency. If I have the period and I want to find B, I'm going to do 2 pi over B to, well, that'll get me period, but I could do 2 pi over the period to get me B. Okay, so that's that. C and D are unique here. They're my shifts. Now C represents a phase shift. Now we know from all the other types of problems that we've done that usually things inside the parentheses with X are backwards, and that is true. If I have something like blah, 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 X plus four, that does not mean you take your sinusoidal function and move it to the right four, it's opposite. That actually means move it left four. So that is a horizontal shift, also known as a phase shift. Last but not least, D is my vertical shift, but that also introduces a new concept called the midline. Now a midline is a horizontal line that cuts my sinusoidal function in half. Okay, it is a horizontal line, which is Y equals some random number. D gives me that number. 
So D basically takes the middle of my sinusoidal function and shifts it up or down depending on whether this is positive or negative. And very often you will be asked, hey, what's the midline? The midline is D, okay? So that is the typical equation. We will use this equation a million bazillion times during this slideshow, this video. Memorize it, know it, love it, worship it. Don't worship it, but just, you know, know it. All right, <clears throat> we talked about amplitude. How amplitude affects a graph can be seen in this picture here. Here I give you cos, I give you three cos, I give you five cos. Here's regular cos, see how it peaks out at one? Here's three cos, see how it peaks out at three? Here's five cos, see how it peaks out at five? That's it. That's it. The period does not change. Notice how all of these hit the x-axis at the same exact spot. Notice how all of these repeat its cycle at 2 pi. That's because the amplitude has no effect on any shift, no effect on any uh, period, any frequency. It just affects the height. If I were to make one of these guys negative, then you're just going to literally take your guy and reflect it over the x-axis like you normally do when you have a negative um, transformation like that. Okay, so that's amplitude. I think we probably feel comfortable if we feel comfortable with the first four sections of this uh, unit. We feel comfortable with amplitude. Same thing with period, but frequency is kind of the new guy. Okay, now again, when you're given a number in front of x, that number is called your frequency. So in a case like this, the frequency would be 1. Okay, now if, and so I would say B equals one because the number in front of X is usually represented by B whenever we have that equation. Now, if I wanted to find the period, you find the period by doing two pi over the frequency. So two pi over one means that sine X has a period of two pi. We know that sine pi is in purple, in purple, or sine x is in purple, so it starts out at 0, 0, and it repeats itself at 2 pi. When I multiply a number to x, it compresses things, okay? It takes my period and it shortens it. Why? Well, b in this case would be pi. So the period in this case would be 2 pi over my period or with my frequency, which is pi, that cancels out and gives me two. Two pi is six point something. Two is two. So if you look at this guy, this repeats its process and we're looking at the black line. This repeats its process every two. So right there is two. And then it repeats it again at four and repeats it again at six and so on and so forth. So multiplying a number to X compresses your function. Dividing a number, stretches it out, okay? And so I would look at this and some people might be like, well, there's no number in front of X. X is on, the, the number's on the bottom. Listen, buddy, stop talking like that. And you can write this out as one third X, which means B would be one third. So my period would be two pi over one third. Oh my goodness, a fraction on the bottom? Well, let's just multiply the top and the bottom by its reciprocal, which is three over one or three, and these guys cancel out, and so the period is six pi. Okay, so looking at this red line, even though we don't see it, this stretches out to three pi, but over here at negative three pi, we see that it's kind of like on the x-axis, and then it goes below, and then it goes above, and then it repeats itself from negative three pi to regular three pi, which is six pi, okay? So the period is every time or how many units it takes for something to cycle, okay? And the frequency kind of has to almost do with like a rate, so to speak. It actually deals with the angle measurement created by like a circle and when dealing with these things. That's something that we'll see in future, future videos, I'm sure, knowing myself. Last but not least, we're gonna look at the vertical and the horizontal shifts. So in orange, yellow, whatever you want to call it, you see your regular cosine starting out at one and then bottoming out. When I take cosine and I subtract pi over two from it, what I'm actually doing is I'm taking my cosine function and I'm moving it right half a pi. So now it's there. And it just so happens 
that cos x minus pi over 2 is sine x. Isn't that something? You, we'll, we'll deal with that later. We'll deal with that later. Cos x plus 3 on the outside means I take the regular cosine function that starts at 1, and I go up 1, 2, 3. Is that 4? I think that's 4. Oh, that's because it starts at 1. Yeah, okay, so my fault. 1, 2, 3. Okay. Okay. All right. So uh, let's get started. Uh, this is basically for sine x. I'm going to sketch this knowing what I know. Maybe what I could do is answer the questions first. That might be helpful. If I was comparing this to y equals, that is an eraser, y equals a sine uh, parentheses B X minus C. I'm doing a lot and I'm wasting a whole lot of time because I don't have a minus C. I don't have a B and I don't have a D. All this is, is this is basically just saying, look, that's my amplitude. My amplitude is four. Okay. Uh, my frequency is the number in front of X. So B is invisible one. The way you find your period if given b is the period is 2 pi over the frequency. So period is 2 pi over 1, which is 2 pi. So all this is, is the sine function stretched out. Okay, so let's try to draw that out. <laughs> Holy cow. <laughs> Uh, drawing lines is not that fun. And I was like, maybe I should include graphs. No, I don't need a graph. I'll just make my own. I do have graphs later, but I don't know. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. It peaks out at four. It bottoms out at negative four. This is sine, which starts at zero, zero. It'll peak out at 4, and that will happen at pi over 2. And then it'll come down at regular pi and cross the x-axis, bottom out at negative 4 at 3 pi over 2, and then repeat the process at 2 pi. So let me try to draw this out. Okay, starts as a sign, so it starts at 0, 0, peaks out at 4, and that happens at pi over 2. Then it bottoms out at pi. Well, not bottoms out, but it hits the x-axis. Completely bottoms out at 3 pi over 2, and then comes back up to repeat the process at 2 pi. And then more, and then more, and then more, more, more. All I had to worry about here uh, was the amplitude. That's the only difference. Just the amplitude. All right, what's next? Hmm. f of x equals negative cos x. Sketch it. All right. Well, the only thing I have to worry about here is the fact that the amplitude is now a negative number. Cosine, regular cosine, a rough draft, starts out at 1 and goes like this. When you have a negative in front of it, you are literally reflecting everything over the x-axis. So this flips upside down. So let me draw this out. Okay, this won't start out at one. This will start out at negative one. And then it'll come up, hit the x-axis at pi over two. It'll hit one at pi. It'll come back down and hit the x-axis again at three pi over two, and then repeat the process at negative one at two pi. So let me draw that out. Start at negative one, start from the bottom, like Drake. come up and it's going to hit pi over 2 and then it's going to max out at 1 come back down 3 pi over 2 and then repeat right there when does f of x equal 1 on the interval 0 2 pi well here's the interval 0 and 2 pi it hits 1 just once and that just once is right there at pi. So when x is pi is when f of x is equal to 1. 
Okay. When is f of x concave up on uh, the interval 0 to 2 pi? Well, concave up looks like this. And concave up happens here at uh, there to there. Hits an inflection point. So this is concave up, concave down, concave down, concave down, inflection point, concave up, concave up, concave up. So we are concave up between 0 and pi over 2, but not including pi over 2 because you don't include it. It's neither concave up nor concave down on the inflection point union. 3 pi over 2, 2 pi. And technically, I can. Technically, I can include 0 and 2 pi because it's, it is concave down on those and they allow me to include them, so I'm allowed to include them there. I'm allowed to include them there. List all the inflection points. Well, the inflection points are gonna happen at pi over two, three pi over two, five pi over two, negative pi over two. So how can I word that? Ooh, pi over two times K would be like one pi over two or two, times pi over two. No, I can't word it out like that. It has to be k plus pi over two. That's how it would work. k in this case, and by the way, these are x values, so maybe I should say x equals k plus pi over two. k in this case is any integer. So zero plus pi over two is pi over two. One plus pi over 2 is 3 pi over 2. Negative 1 plus pi over 2 is negative pi over 2, so on and so forth. So those are my inflection points. Uh, X is an integer. There you go. Okay? K is an integer. There you go. There you go. Oh, great, a graph. I've, I've smartened up. All right, sketch 3 cos x over 2. Now I'm comparing this to the whole function here, okay? Now I don't have the whole function, so I'm not going to write out the whole function. However, I am going to rewrite this out as 3 cos half of x, okay? Now let's label what I know. The number in front of x, or the whole number in front of the whole thing, is my amplitude, so my amplitude is 3, okay? One half is my frequency, not my period. I find out what my period is by doing two pi over one half. Multiply the top and the bottom by two, these cross out, and I end up with a period of four pi. Okay, so I'm going to, this is a cosine which starts at 1, 2, 3. Okay, the period is 4 pi, which means I'm going, I don't have 4 pi, so I can't like go up here and start all over again. I didn't leave myself enough space, so this is how I'm going to view it. If I max out here, I'm going to bottom out at half of my period. So I'm going to bottom out here at 3 at 2 pi which means I cross the x-axis at regular pi, and I'm going to come back up and hit it again at 3 pi. Now, cosine is an even function. And since I didn't shift anything, especially left or right, horizontally, I know what's going to happen. As I move to the left, I'm going to cross uh, the x-axis at pi. So let me put a dot there. I'm going to bottom out at negative 3 at negative 2 pi, and I'm going to hit negative three pi. So let me try to draw this out the best that I can, which I am really bad at. Although this is looking okay. And now I'm starting to jinx myself because I'm getting confidence and I'm running out of space and I'm not good at this. And I almost made it. My midline is where this guy gets cut in half horizontally. Well, it gets cut in half at the y-axis. Now, we've mentioned before 
that when you add a number to this whole thing, y equals your number is the midline. Well, I have no number added, which means it's zero. So the midline is the equation y equals zero. The maximum value happens at three. The minimum value happens at negative three. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is three cos half a, pi, uh, half a pi or half an x. I mean, half an x, not half a pi, half an x. Three cos half a pi would live right there. Now you know. Now you know. More, 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 more. All you want is more, more, more. Remember the Leave Britney Alone guy? That's what he said. Look it up. It just You youngsters probably have no clue what I'm talking about. Ugh. All right. Now I'm going to really write out the whole thing. Now I'm going to really compare this to A uh, sine B parentheses X minus C close parentheses close parentheses plus D. Now, the nice thing here is B is invisible one, so I don't have to panic. I don't have to fear. B is invisible one. My amplitude is three. That minus pi means I shift this to the right pi. That's a horizontal shift to the right pi. Remember, it's backwards land when you deal with signs. Uh, inside the X parentheses. This means I have a horizontal or a vertical shift of positive one. So I go up positive one. Okay. So this is how I'm going to draw this out. Okay. My midline is Y equals one. So I'm going to draw my midline to begin this out. This kind of acts as my new X axis. Okay. When I draw this out. Since I have a horizontal shift moving to the right pi, that means I begin my sign at pi. Since my frequency is one, that means my period is two pi. So at pi, three pi it repeats, negative pi it repeats negative three pi, it repeats, okay? I start out at this new point. My amplitude is three, which means I go up three and then recross here, go down three, recross. So going the other way, I'd go up here, recross, down, recross, up, recross, down, recross. All right, so again, this right here is my starting point. I'm going to go up halfway in between my, so basically a fourth of the period, which is half a pi. That's when I make sure I'm up three spaces because this is sine. Then I, every three quarters of a pi, that happens again. So here I am at two pi, halfway in between, go down three, there you have it. Okay, so now I'm running out of space. Now let's go to the left. I'm gonna go in between one quarter of my period, go down three, I'll come back up. A quarter of my period is up three, come back down. A quarter of my period is down three, go back up. A quarter of my period is up three, go back down, try to draw this out. Okay, this is where I began. Okay, sign goes up like that first then makes its way down, then back down again, then makes its way up. And do it again. Holy cow. Holy cow. Do it again. I did it again. I'm just not good at drawing these things. Why don't I, since I'm not good at drawing them right to left, why don't I draw them left to right? Okay, I have the dots. Hope everyone's having a good day. I hope uh, now would be a time to, what do YouTubers say in these moments? Uh, smash the subscribe button, drop a comment. There we go. All right, I did it. After all of that, my maximum value is four. My minimum value is negative two. Uh, 
look at this one. This one's different. Let's write out our formula. Y equals A sine B parentheses X minus C close it, close it plus D. Now you might be like different. Yeah, there's more numbers. Uh, I see parentheses here, but I don't see parentheses here. So this is what you must do each and every time that you don't have that set of parentheses and you're adding or subtracting inside and you have something in front of X. You need to factor out the number in front of X, no matter what it is, factor it out. You divide it from that guy. Fortunately, this one's friendly enough, but you have to divide it out. You have to factor it out. So this becomes two sine, factor out the two, that leaves us with x minus, divide that by 2, so 2 pi, parentheses, uh, parentheses again, minus 1. Now let's analyze what we have. The number in front of sine is my amplitude, so my amplitude is 2. My frequency is the number in front of x when it's factored like that, so b is 2. What that means though, is my period is going to be two pi over that B. So two pi over two, which simplifies out to pi. So that's my period, sometimes spelled with a T. All you youngsters know what that means. Um, what else? This is minus two pi inside the parentheses, which means I'm going to have a horizontal or a phase shift going to the right positive two pi distance. Minus one means I go down one, or in other words, my midline is y equals negative one. So now what I have to do is I have to draw out my regular sign thing and have my new starting spot. So the way I write out that starting spot is I always draw out my midline first, which is negative one. So I'm gonna draw out y equals negative one right there, okay? This shifts over or begins at right to pi. So that guy right there is where I'm going to start my sign. Okay, sign starts at the origin that it's supposed to start at. So it's gonna start up there. It's not cosine where it starts here. It's sine where it starts there. The period is pi. So you're gonna repeat every pi. So you're gonna repeat here, repeat here, repeat here, repeat here, repeat here, repeat here. Okay, so what would happen is this goes up a couple, comes back down, crosses again, goes down and repeats. So while we're at it, let's draw the spots where it crosses this new midline axis again. So every half it's going to cross, every half a period it's going to cross right there. Now, again, it's going to start here, go up two, and then come back down. So every quarter of a period and every three quarters of a period, it's going to peak out and then bottom out. So let's say that every quarter of a period, it's going to go up two, every quarter 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 up two. Every Every three quarters down to, every three quarters down to, every three quarters down to. Hell is repetition, the book once said. The book was called Storm of the Century. Hell is repetition. Well, welcome to the Math Teacher Code channel. All right. <sighs> Time to draw this puppy out. So I start out here. Let's get a different color. Looks so pretty, by the way. Um, goes up, comes down, goes down, comes up, and repeat. So let me do this over here because I'm not good at going right to left. Basically, if you're bad at drawing these, so am I. Okay, and so like it's kind of like my my channel is like learn how to draw signs with a guy who doesn't have any artistic talent whatsoever all right almost there that looks bad almost there Ugh. did the best i could
did the best I could. But there you have it. And again, it's tricky there. That's the trick. The trick is to make this look like this by factoring out the number in front of X. It has to be the number in front of X. And if for any reason, like that's a three, then you would have to do like four thirds pi and it just gets grosser and it is what it is. But yeah, that's, that's how you do it. That is how you do it. Oh, I got to stop. Otherwise uh, I'm going to get flagged for copyright. I'm not Montel Jordan. Show why both of these are true. These are fun little trigonometric identities. Hey, did you know that if I take sine and shift it to the left pi over two, that I get cosine? Let's show that. Let's show that. Let's show that if I were to take sine, so I'm going to draw a very, very, very basic picture of sine. It's not going to look good at all. Okay, but I'm going to try to do this in one foul swoop, right? I have pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, and 2 pi, okay? If I were to take regular sine, which looks like this, okay? And if I were to move this to the left pi over two, so let's go over here to, to the left pi over two. If I were to move this to the left pi over two, it's cosine, you see it? It's cosine because that guy starts there. And if I drew my lines a little bit more correctly, you would get cosine. Well, look at that. Look at God, look at God. All right, well, let's try this again. Let's try this again. If I were to take a regular cosine function, which tell you what, let's just use this guy. Let's use this guy because that is cosine now. If I were to take regular cosine and move that to the left. So let's extend this graph just a little bit further to the left, a little bit further to the left and make you negative, uh, uh, what is that, pi? Okay, if I were to move you to the left, oh, the picture's not good. The picture's not good. Here, let's do this. Perfect. If I were to do that, that is negative sign. Write a sine equation for the graph below. All right, sine equation. We've got y equals a uh, times sine b parentheses x minus c close it close it plus d all right what do i have first things first we should always draw the midline so it peaks out of five bottoms out of one the midline's halfway in between that which is three so the midline is the equation y equals three which means d is three we max out at five we bottom out at one, which means the amplitude is two. That's what I know. This is sine and sine is supposed to start at zero, zero. This does, there is no uh, horizontal phase shift. And the period for this guy is two pi, which means the frequency is one. So these are the only two pieces of information that I need to come up with my equations. So y equals two sine one x, no phase shift. So I'll simplify this, I'll clean this up in a minute, plus three, okay? So you're not necessary. Y equals two sine regular x, because one times x is just regular x, plus three. Okay. I can handle that. I can handle that just fine. Write a cosine equation for this graph. Okay. Y equals a cos uh, parentheses B parentheses X minus C close it, close it plus D. All right. Uh, cosine starts at one zero. 
that doesn't happen here. No, let's not panic. Let's not panic. I need a midline, which this peaks out at one, bottoms out at what appears to be negative three. So the midline is going to be at negative one. The midline is at negative one. So that gives us D of negative one. Uh, if I peak out at one and bottom out at three, that means my amplitude is two, which I believe it was last time. So not really a creative job when I come up with these examples. Uh, that's that. Now, cosine is supposed to start up here. And it didn't. So why don't I pick a new starting spot where it is supposed to start at the tippy top? And that's right here. So it starts here, which means I moved to the right pi to make that happen. Okay, so I'm moving to the right pi. I'm moving, I'm moving down one. I have an amplitude of two. Now I need my period. My period is two pi again. So that makes life easy, which makes my frequency one. Okay, so my amplitude is A. Y equals A, which is two cosine b, which is 1, times parentheses x. If I move to the right pi, then it's going to be x minus pi. Close it. Close it. And then minus 1. So let's clean this up. y equals 2 cos, distribute the 1, x minus pi, minus one. All right. A Ferris wheel, by the way, AP pre-calc exam problems love the Ferris wheel problem. Um, pretty popular. You'll see it probably on a practice test or an actual test here and there, Ferris wheel problem. The Ferris wheel has a diameter of 40 meters and rotates at a rate of 0.2 revolutions per minute. The bottom of the wheel is located two uh, meters above the ground. Create a sinusoidal equation to represent the height of the passenger as a function of time, assuming the passenger boards at the, boards at the lowest point. Okay, boards at the lowest point means uh, not sine. So I, I could use sine. I could use sine. It doesn't really matter. You could use sine. You could use cosine. Uh, it, it's all really good with these things. But you have y equals a sine b x minus c close it close it plus d. All right. Diameter is 40 meters, which means your 20 you're 20, okay? You are at its lowest two meters off the ground, okay? Which means here it has a midline of 22, the Taylor Swift special, and then it peaks out at 42, the Jackie Robinson special, okay? So I have that going for me. So this is what I know. I know my amplitude is going to be 20. Now, before I get too much into this, okay, this is what's going on. Okay. Uh, and you know what, let me lower this a lot because we're talking about real life and you can't go underground. You're starting at two, you're starting at two. And uh, at some point you peak out at 42 and you're at the bottom and then you make your way up and then you're at the top and you make your way down and you repeat and you repeat and you repeat, 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 repeat. Okay, now the midline happens here at 22, the Taylor Swift special. So that gives me a D of 22. I still need C and I still need B. My B can be found by figuring out what my period is. Now, this guy rotates at 0.2 revolutions per minute. 0.2 revolutions per minute, 
which means it takes five minutes for a complete revolution. That is really slow. But the period is going to be five. Now, do I want my period? No, I want my frequency. And in order to find my frequency, I take two pi and divide it by my period. So that would be my frequency. So I don't have to simplify. That kind of makes life a little bit easier. The trickiest part about all of this is the phase shift. Okay, because if I start at the very bottom, sine or cosine doesn't start at the very bottom of anything. Sine is supposed to start here, which means I have to go right a certain amount of time. Now, this whole thing, this whole thing, has a period of five, all right? So me going from the bottom to the middle is going to be one quarter of a turn, which means a quarter of five. Okay, so this guy is going to be five over four, which means my phase shift is positive five over four. Not pleasant at all, but I don't really have to make it pleasant. I could just write this out. Y equals 20 sine parentheses B, which is two pi over five parentheses x minus 5 over 4. That'll actually simplify out just fine. Close it, close it, and then plus 22, the Taylor Swift special. Let me write that out. Let me simplify this out and clean it up. I didn't give myself near enough space. Okay, let me write it out here. y equals 20 sine distribute. We get 2 pi over 5x minus two over four is a half, five over five cancels out, so half a pi, so pi over two. That's not too bad. Minus pi over two, close that, plus 22. And that's the Ferris wheel problem. Pretty tricky stuff. Not gonna lie. All right, last problem is a calculator problem. I love this problem. I invented it, not gonna lie. NGL, not gonna lie. Uh, made me think of the office. I tried to think of what are things that behave in a sinusoidal way that's kind of floating off the ground a little bit. Well, let's take a big movie screen. Let's have a big movie screen and the DVD logo going boop, 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 boop. And the way that this travels, the height of the DVD logo travels in a sinusoidal function. So this is what's happening. A DVD logo is slowly floating along a movie screen in a movie theater. The height of the logo at given times is given by the table below. No problem, <laughs> I, forgot, I forgot the word. Um, so, you know, at zero minutes, the, the DVD logo is like four, meters off the ground. And after one minute, it's seven meters off the ground. And after two minutes, it's 10 meters off the ground. Boop, 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 boop. Use a calculator to perform sinusoidal regression to find an equation representing the height above the ground as a function of time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run to a calculator. I'm going to type all this information in, and that's going to give me an equation that represents a sine function for this data right here. All right, stat, let's type out these numbers, zero, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, and that's it. And then we got friendly numbers, thank goodness for that. It's four, seven, 10, uh, seven, four, one, four. All right, <clears throat> so we need to do sinusoidal regression. So you're gonna go to stat, you're gonna go to calc, and you're gonna go up because it's like right there at C, sine reg. You're gonna hit enter. 
we are going to need to use this guy later. Also, the period, uh, it goes from four to four, and it goes from zero to six to do that. So the period is six. We're going to use this equation later. So let's go to vars, y vars, enter, enter, and see what grossness we come up with. All right. So y equals 3.954 times sine parentheses 1.057 minus 0 0.527, lots of rounding up, and then close the parentheses, plus 5.569, uh, more rounding up. I wasn't laughing at that number, I swear. Uh, let's write that out. All right, so that equation ended up being y equals 3.954 sine parentheses 1.057x minus 0 0.527 plus 5.569. So there's your equation. Sin reg, sine reg. I hope we don't sin reg, meaning regularly. Almost done. Use that equation to predict the height of the object at t equals eight minutes. All right, so I have my equation. I know I stored my equation. All I have to do is just find out what happens when t equals 8. All right, so now that I have this equation stored in y equals, why don't we go to zoom trig so we can kind of have a good idea of what it looks like. Not too happy with that. Um, this is the, the, the floating DVD logo, so I need to kind of go a little bit higher. So let's change my window from, it gave me what, 0? So let's go 0. And by the way, if we're talking about real life stuff here, uh, let's do like negative one because we're not going to have negative time. So let's bump this out to 20. I mean, the future problem has eight minutes and 10 minutes. So let's bump this out to 12, not 20. Uh, the height of this thing peaked out at, uh, what was it, 10? So let's bump it up to 11. Let's bump it up to 11. All right, Y max. Not to be confused with IMAX, speaking of movie theaters. And let's graph. Mm. So the DVD logo is floating around and it goes boop, 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 boop. And in this particular problem, problem B, we care about when, uh, or at, not when, but where we are at moment eight. So I can do second table. Let's go to my table and go to eight and see where we are off the ground. 9.512, so what is that, meters? 9.512 meters off the ground. So when t was equal to eight, I just plugged in eight, I think I used the table, and I ended up getting 9.512 meters off the ground. So that was the answer for B. C is after 10 minutes, when will the logo hit the five meter mark? So since this is sinusoidal and it is a sign, it, it's gonna look like this. So there's gonna be multiple times where this is gonna go up and down and up and down and up and down and hit five meters. I care about when after 10 minutes, the first time it hits the 10 meter mark. So if the 10 meter mark starts there and this is five, for example, I care about the first time it hits that. Okay, so let's see what we come up with. All right, last but not least, after 10 minutes, when will the logo hit the five meter mark? So we care about what happens after 10. So let's go to my window. And since we care about after 10, let's set this uh, from 10 to 20. And just see it. All right. So it's definitely going to hit the five meter mark uh, at some point. But when? Well, why? equals five gives me that five meter mark if I just enter five. So graph, and right around here is where it's gonna hit that five meter mark. So let's find the intersection between these two lines. Second trace intersect is gonna give me that. So let's scooch to the left because I want the first time it hits that five meter mark. So let's scooch to the left of it, hit enter. Let's hit right a few times to the right of it hit enter, hit enter again, 
and it's going to tell me 12.2561, so 12.256 minutes. So after the 10 minute mark, we ended up with 12.256 minutes. So 12 minutes and 256 seconds. Uh, all right, that covers a pretty important chunk about AP Precalculus sinusoidal functions. Hope this helps. Thank you so much for watching. Like and subscribe. Bye. We are going to start the second half of Unit 3 in AP Precalculus. Tangents and inverses and other things. Just jump right into it. Tangent, what is it? Well, by definition, tangent is sine over cosine. So we will write out tan theta equals sine theta over cos theta. Now, at this point, we should know what a sine graph and what a cosine graph looks like. But tangent is going to look very different. One of the reasons why is you now have a theta, like an x value, in the denominator. So you should expect to see a few vertical asymptotes. Now, this is what tangent looks like graphically. First things first, you're used to a period of 2 pi. Not anymore. The period for tangent is regular pi. Okay, vertical asymptotes. Never had vertical asymptotes for sine and cosine. Well, now you do because cosine theta is going to equal zero in certain spots, like at pi over two, or three pi over two, or negative pi over two, so on and so forth. Okay, now let's graph what this looks like generally. Obviously, you know, those of you who watch my videos know that I'm not good at drawing graphs, but I will try my best. So what did I say? Vertical asymptotes at pi over 2. So we'll label u as pi over 2. Vertical asymptotes at 3 pi over 2. So we'll label u as such. And then u will be negative pi over 2. And u will be negative 3 pi over 2. And so on and so forth. Now tangent has this weird curve looking thing that goes through 0, 0. Okay. The tangent um, cosine of zero is one, so sine of zero is zero, so that, that makes sense. And then it kind of looks like this. It's like this weird concave down, inflection point, concave up, okay? And then it does it again here at pi. So I don't even write that down. So concave down hits concave up. Same thing over here at negative pi concave down hits concave up. I could have done a better job, but, you know, uh, pay me more. But that, that's basically what tangent looks like graphically. It's different for sure. The thing you're going to have to remember the most is the period is a pi, so that changes our answers when we solve for tangent. But for the most part, that's what tangent does. Tangent is sine over cosine, and many of the things that we do will be based off of that fun fact. Inverse trig functions and graphs. Now, an inverse trig function is used in a moment like this. Say you have sine x equals a half, and your job is to solve for x. You know, normally when we have something in front of x, you would be like, divide both sides. There's no such thing as dividing a sine when solving for x. What you do is you inverse sine both sides. Inverse sine both sides. And basically what you're doing is that cancels out, and you're asking my, yourself or myself, um, what angle gives me the or the sine of what angle gives me a half, and then you take it from there, and then you have your answers and so on and so forth. Okay. Now, um, one of the things that you have to remember is if I give you a sine, and then I ask you to give information about the inverse sine the domain and the range flip. So the domain of sine is the range of inverse sine. The domain or the range of sine is the inverse, is the range, 
the range of sine is the domain of inverse sine. Third time's a charm. All the rules apply to like cosine, tangent, fun stuff like that. Now, one other word is uh, the word invertible. Okay. Now, invertible, if, not to be confused with convertible. I think I spelled that right. Invertible means can you take the inverse of something? something? And uh, what that is, is you use what's called a horizontal line test. Now, you're used to the vertical line test, but vertical line test is used if I give you a picture that looks like this, right? And you want to be like, hey, is that a function? You draw yourself a vertical line. You see if that vertical line passes through the graph and it does more than once. It's not a function. Well, when you take something that's the inverse, you are graphing it over the y equals x axis. And so what you're doing is you're kind of making it a little sideways and backwards at the same time. So if I were to give you this picture and ask you is, and let me draw the same picture, is this graph invertible? You would make a horizontal line like so, and you would pass that through the graph and notice that in this case, it doesn't hit the graph more than once. So you would be like, yeah, that one's invertible. That means the inverse of this graph exists, even though the function is not a function. It's not a function in itself because it fails the vertical line test, but the inverse exists. That's what invertible means. Does the inverse exist? And you use the horizontal line test to do it. Now let's take a look at our three new friends, secant, cosecant, cotangent. Okay, secant abbreviated as SEC, college, uh, is the same as one over cosine theta. Okay, cosecant abbreviated that is the same as one over sine theta and cotangent abbreviated that is the same as one over tangent which happens to be the uh, reciprocal of regular tangent which we saw a couple slides ago so why don't we just flip those as well Now we will get into graphing these guys and what the pictures look like. We will get into that, okay? So don't you worry your pretty little heads off. Uh, what's gonna happen is already you will notice, uh-oh, denominator problems. And so we're gonna have vertical asymptotes and things like that, but we'll worry about that when we have to worry about that. All right, now the last thing that we're gonna look at is probably the most frustrating thing that we're gonna look at because it's a lot of memorization, but it's not super bad. Okay, there's three Pythagorean theorem identities that you're going to see with trigonometry. Sine squared theta plus cos squared theta is going to equal one. Now, usually when you see that, that might end up turning into like one minus, like sine squared equals one minus cos squared, something like that. You will see that every now and then. Definitely memorize this. I'm not sure if you need to have these next two memorized, but I'm just going to put them in here just in case. Secant squared theta minus tangent squared theta is going to equal one. And cosecant squared theta minus cotangent squared theta equals one. Okay. Definitely have the red memorized. The double angle formulas, the double angle identities is what if instead of giving you like sine something, I give you sine two theta? Well, you can rewrite sine two theta as two sine theta cos theta. Memorize that. Also, cos two theta is going to be cos squared theta minus sine squared theta. Now you might be looking at this and saying, boy, oh boy, that's awfully close to that. It sure is, but it's not the same. It's very close though, which might mean you might do problems where you have to rewrite things and remind yourself that cos squared, by the way, is the same as one minus sine squared. So technically you could say that this is also one minus two sine squared theta. 
This is also the same as two cos squared theta minus one. You just rewrite it in different ways. Fun stuff. Have both of those memorized. Also have, and there's, co there's tangent ones too, but again, we're only going to uh, concern ourselves with the sine and cosine because if we have to deal with the tangent ones, we will use what the definition of tangent is. I don't want to try to memorize too much. The tangent two theta is it's not pretty. Okay. Uh, similarly with this, the sum, the sum and difference formulas, if I give you sine alpha plus beta, okay, you can write that as sine alpha cos beta. And you know what? Let's, let's combine them, plus or minus, okay? You're going to get plus or minus cos alpha sine beta. So if I do sine alpha plus beta, it'll be sine alpha cos beta plus cos alpha sine beta. If I do sine alpha minus beta, it'll be sine alpha cos beta minus cos alpha sine beta. Okay. Last one that we're going to look at is going to be cosine alpha plus or minus beta. Okay. This is going to be cos alpha cos beta flip these guys sine alpha sine beta okay so this would like if i gave you cos alpha plus beta you would write out cos alpha cos beta minus sine alpha sine beta and vice versa and vice versa all right let's see let me move my face all right, so uh, we're going to start out with a very not fun looking uh, tangent graph. Okay, and then we're going to graph it. All right, let's move my face, like I said, although I'm not sure if I need to. No, I don't need to. I'm good. What is the period? Well, I have to rewrite this. I have to rewrite it because, again, I'm kind of comparing this to my regular sinusoidal graph. Okay, so I'm going to write this as tan A for amplitude, even though we don't have an amplitude. Uh, B, X minus C, close it, close it, plus D. Okay, A doesn't really give us amplitude because now the picture looks like this, so I'm not going to worry about amplitude. There's no such thing as amplitude, but it has to do with like stretch and stuff like that, compression. We don't have to worry about that here because there's no number there. Uh, if I rewrite this, and factor out a two, I have two times X minus pi, close it, close it, minus one. Now what this looks like is normally, if I have this number, I would say, ah, the way you find the period is you do two pi over two. Mm -mm -mm. Now it's regular pi over two instead of two pi over two. So my period is now pi over two. This is going to shift to the right pi and shift down negative one. Okay, so what is the period? Pi over two. What is the frequency? Regular two. What is an equation for all vertical asymptotes? Oh, okay, uh, well, if my, let's draw this out and then I'll do the vertical asymptotes. Okay, so first things first. Uh, my new origin, so to speak, has me going right pi down to, so things are going to start right there. My period is pi over 2, right? So uh, what that means is pi over 2 to the right, pi over 2 to the left. And I'm going to go pi over 2 every that many times. So now I'm drawing out my vertical asymptotes. Hmm. This is fun. Now, as I'm doing this, uh, I'm going to remember what I wrote out in the previous slide, what tangent looks like. Okay. And now tangent's going to go through negative one through each of these. So here, 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 here. And it's going to kind of look like the, oh gosh. So bad at these. 
All right, so let's try to curve things. Yeah, there we go. All right, so wow, better. Wow, kind of missed the dot, but that's all right. You get the idea. Look, problem solved. Wow, 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 wow. Now, I'm not going to worry about the ones to the left and to the right at the very end. I've done enough. Now, the equation for all the vertical asymptotes looks like what's happening is I can pick one vertical asymptote. Like, that's pi over 4. Right there. That's pi over 4. So, what's happening is it's going to be a vertical line. So, x equals. It's going to have a period of pi over 2. So, what I can do is if I pick, uh, like, pi over 2k and just add pi over 4, that should do the job. Okay? So, like, if this was 0, I would have 0 plus pi over 4. Nailed it. If this was 1, I'd have pi over 2 plus pi over 4, which is going to be that guy. Nailed it. And then I could choose uh, any one I want. But, yeah, those are uh, all the vertical asymptotes for tangent. Isn't that neat? Given an angle theta in standard position where sine theta equals cos theta equals root 2 over 2, what is tan theta? Oh, this is going to be super easy. Tan theta is sine theta over cos theta. I already told you what sine theta and cos theta are. Sine theta is root 2 over 2. Cos theta is root 2 over 2. Something over itself is just one. Now, this makes sense, and here's why. Tangent represents sine, which is a y value. Cosine represents x, which is an x value. Okay, now, y over x, that's like up and over. <gasps> this is slope. And if I go up root 2 over 2 and over root 2 over 2, that's a perfect slope of regular 1. Oh, it makes sense how this makes sense, which takes us to B. What is the slope of the terminal ray? Well, the slope of the terminal ray is tangent. And I just found out that tan theta equals 1, so it's the same exact answer. Look at that. A little definition for you. All right, wardrobe change, location change. I'm at my home uh, and just in time to do this ugly, terrible, ugly problem. First things first, this is the original function that I'm giving you. It's a mess. It goes up to three, goes down to negative three. It moves to the right a little bit. It has a different period and I'm giving you a domain. Not only is that a thing, I don't even care about the grant. I don't care about any of that. I want you to find the inverse which is going to be a mess. So what I always do when finding the inverse is f of x drives me nuts, so I'm going to change it to y. So y equals 3 sine pi x minus pi over 2. And step number one when finding the inverse is flip-flop the x and the y. So x equals 3 sine pi y minus pi over 2. So many pies. <laughs> it's like we're at Thanksgiving. <laughs> uh, now I need to solve for the new y. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of that 3 because that's really the only thing I can do. And I'm going to divide 3 from both sides and let me move that over here. So x over 3. I'm going to need all this space. I'm going to want all this space, especially for graphing. Uh, x over 3 equals, you're now gone, and you know what, I know what's next, so let me leave the space, sine parentheses pi y minus pi over 2. Now, all the other stuff lives within the sine, so the next step is to get rid of the sine. How do I get rid of the sine? Inverse sine both sides, so inverse sine u and inverse sine u. That allows these to cross out, and now I have sine inverse of x over 3 equals pi y minus pi over 2, which is, you know, manageable. Still gross, but manageable. Add pi over 2 to both sides, so inverse sine of x over 3 plus pi over 2 equals pi 
y. And rather divide everything by pi, which I could do, I'm going to multiply both sides by 1 over pi because it's going to help me deal with the fact that I have two things in distributed property and a pi that's going to disappear. It's going to make it look prettier at the end of the day. Now, the nice thing is y is now all by itself. y, which becomes f inverse. So let me write it out as f inverse of x. 1 over pi times sine of x over 3. Inverse sine of x over 3 is 1 over pi times inverse sine of x over 3. Distribute. 1 over pi times pi over 2. The pi's cancel out as a half. All right. Great. Now, the graph of an inverse sine okay, normally is the graph of the inverse of a regular sign. Okay, regular sign look like this, okay? Graph of an inverse sign you're thinking is probably going to look like this. But here's the problem. That's not a function. That's why I gave you that domain because this is what's gonna happen now. Since this guy, this guy right here has a alt amplitude, I almost said altitude, amplitude of three. The range of this guy is negative three to three because the amplitude is the range, gives the range. I have no vertical transformations. I'm not moving up or down. So that is my range for sure. This is my domain. And if you're like, well, what do we care? We're not graphing the original function. What do we care? Well, if I'm supposed to graph the inverse, I care about the domain of the original and the range of the original because the range of the original is the domain of the inverse. Uh, and the domain of the original is the range of the inverse. So what I get is I get this guy right here Okay, it's going to look like this. Uh, just, well, it's gonna look like that. Okay, this is my function. It's going to stretch out to negative three and three, and it's going to have a range of zero to one, which means it's going to have, we're not gonna call it midline, but it's kind of like, like our midline of one half. Okay, so let me try to draw that out one more time. Okay, because that's not, that's not, doesn't look good at all. Okay, not that that looks even better. One, two, three, one, two, three, one. Okay, and it's going to go here and kind of go like that. Just imagine more of a curve, like a, a change of concavity should happen. Here, let me do this. Let me make it bold. That way no one will ever notice how bad it looks. So if you kind of can see it, a slight change of concavity, like right there on the y-axis. Not easy, not fun. Hopefully you'll never have to do that like on a test. But we did it here and you know, that's that's the battle. Great, I have to do another one. Do I? No, oh, thank you, Jesus. All right, I have 10, f of x equals 10. I'm going to sketch regular f of x. I can handle this. But instead of sketching the original, I'm going to do it by making a table. All right, so what does that mean? Well, let's graph regular f of x, or let's graph, uh, yeah, let's make a table, not graph, but make a table of regular f of x. Let me adjust my pad because I'm, all my lines are crooked. Um, f of x tangent has a period of pi and starts out at 0, 0. Remember, tangent looks like this and goes through the origin, which means it only stretches out to negative pi over 2. So I'll start at negative pi over 2. I'll do negative pi over 4, 0 pi over four and pi over two. Okay, the inverse or the tangent of negative pi over two is undefined, okay? Vertical asymptote, vertical asymptote. Oof. It's supposed to say done. I had a timer, I forgot that I had a timer. At negative pi over two or negative pi over four, it's negative one. At zero, it's zero. At pi over four, it's one. And here we're undefined again, okay? 
Now I'm going to sketch the F inverse by flipping everything. Okay, so the F inverse is going to look a little something like this. So X, F inverse, uh, I am undefined at negative pi over two, uh, at uh, pi over four, or at negative one, and then zero, one, undefined. I have negative pi over four, zero, uh, pi over four, pi over two. Okay. Okay. Now, here's the thing. If at X, I'm undefined, right? That means over here was a vertical asymptote. So if over here is a vertical asymptote, what happens here is going to be a horizontal asymptote because of the way um, inverses work. So at negative pi over two, which I'll call this negative pi over two, so you would be pi over four, negative pi over four, you would be uh, positive pi over four, you would be positive pi over two. We have horizontal asymptotes, that looks awful, here and here and here. At negative one, I'm at negative pi over four, zero, zero. And at positive one, I'm at regular pi over four. So the graph is going to basically limit out here and look like that. Okay. So describing this, what would this look like? Well, this is a, uh, let me use AP pre-calculus words. This is a horizontal shift positive six units or six units to the right. And this is a vertical shift positive four units or four units up. So basically you take the red thing and go, whoop, whoop. you got to make those noises, otherwise it doesn't count. Also, you have to write out the word right, but draw an arrow from up for up because I'm an idiot. All right, now I have to sketch another graph and it's going to be two cosecant pi theta minus pi plus one. All right. All right, cosecant, if you remember, is the same as one over sine. So this follows a lot of the sine rules, but sine acts as our, kind of like our blueprint, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to treat this like a sine. The sine is going to give us our blueprint, and from there we can draw the cosine. Cosine and secant when graphed look like these parabolas that kind of, you know, flip-flop, go up, down, up, down, up, down. By drawing out sine or cosine, depending on if this was secant, as like a blueprint, if we were to draw this out, the blueprint lets us know which parabolas go up, which parabolas go down, where do they start, stuff like that. So I look at a guy like this, right? Nothing in front of theta, which tells me the period is two pi, right? Uh, two is in front of cosecant, which tells me the amplitude is two, okay? Uh, a horizontal phase shift of positive pi, which means right pi units, and I go up one. Okay, so the blueprint for this guy is going to be a sign. It's going to be a sign that I go right pi up one and would normally start right here okay now the red that i'm going to draw is going to be my blueprint the blue that i'm going to draw is going to be my actual graph okay so my blueprint period of two pi so you repeat the process here you repeat the process here you repeat the process here okay since this is sine and i'm not flipping it upside down I'm going to uh, hit my midline every pi. And since the amplitude is two, I'm going to go up two, hit 
down to. So going in reverse, down to, oh, hold on, made a mistake there. Let's move you up because that would be going down three. Put a dot here. So you would be going down, going up, going down, going up. Now, again, this is my blueprint. This is not at all my secant graph, cosecant graph. Okay, but by doing this, we now know how our graph is going to behave. Okay, where the midline of my sign would be, would be my vertical asymptotes. Okay, so if you wanted to, if you really wanted to go above and beyond, put your vertical asymptotes right here. Okay, where the midline would be. The midline uh, is a line that goes through the middle, goes through the inflection points, goes through where you cross your x-axis, you know, stuff like that. All right, almost done, almost done, almost, almost done. And then I can graph my actual graph, which is not going to look good. Singing. All right, so... Peaks out there, bottoms out there, peaks out there, bottoms out there, peaks out there, bottoms out there. Parabola opening upwards here, parabola opening downwards there. Parabola opening upwards here, parabola opening downwards there. Parabola opening upwards here. Oh gosh, <laughs> I was doing so well. I was doing so well. I had a little thing in the way. Let me move that over. Uh, parabola going downwards here. There you go. Parabola upwards here. Parabola downwards there. All right. Fun. All right. Solve negative six root three equals negative nine cosecant three. Uh, theta. I don't like cosecant. I'm going to write it out as sine. So I'm going to write this out as negative 6 root 3. Uh, let me do this over 1. You'll see why I'm doing this. Although it's not a necessary step. Equals negative 9 over sine 3 theta. Now that I wrote it out as a proportional, I can treat it as a proportional. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to multiply you to each other, crisscross applesauce. So you are now negative uh, 9 equals negative 6 root 3, 3 pi, sine 3 pi. Negative 6 root 3, sine 3 pi. That's an M. I will just pretend it's not there. Uh, let's divide both sides by negative 6 root 3. Let's divide both sides by negative 6 root 3. Cross u out. You become positive 3 over 2 root 3, but root 3 on the bottom is bad. So positive 3 over 2 root 3. I have to multiply the top and the bottom by root 3. Okay. And what that gives us, let me continue the rest. Let me get rid of that m. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, 2 root 3 times root 3 is 6. 3 root 3 on the top. That simplifies further. Is equal to sine 3 theta. Okay. That becomes root 3 over 2. Equals leave some space. Sine 3. 3 theta. In order to unleash uh, theta, I have to inverse sine both sides. So inverse sine, inverse sine. It crosses you out. So I have the inverse sine of root 3 over 2 equals 3 theta. Now, <clears throat> inverse sine of root 3 over 2 is going to be pi over 3. So that equals 3 theta. Okay. And also 2 pi over 3. 
because sine is positive in quadrants one and two. So two pi over three equals three theta. Divide both sides by three or multiply both sides by a third. The bottom's gonna become nine on both of those. So you get theta, <coughs> excuse me, equals pi over nine. And I'm gonna leave some space and you'll see why. Uh, and two pi over nine, nine. Can I get rid of that three? Now, okay, the finger's coming up again. And here's why. The original problem is three theta. Normally I'd be done, but since this is three theta, uh, I have a period or frequency that is three, which means this cycle repeats three times if we're talking about between uh, three or like, and first off, I didn't even say, uh, oh, okay, so that's another thing. I didn't even say any bounds, so I have to answer this as an equation, right? Well, what's gonna happen is this is going to repeat itself every three times per two pi, which means you're going to have a period that is now two pi over three. So what's going to happen here is you're going to add two pi over three K to that and two pi over three K to that so that between zero and two pi, you're actually going to get six possible solutions. And since I didn't give you an interval, I have an infinite amount of solutions, so I have to say that. K is an integer, I guess I have to say that as well. What a gross, awful, terrible problem. Gross. All right, for this one, I actually do have an interval, which makes life a little bit, a little bit, a little bit easier. But this problem is still kind of gross, except for the fact that I have a bunch of coses uh, lying all over the place. So let me get rid of the one that's over here. So let me subtract two cos theta from you. Seems to make sense. So now I have two root three cos theta sine theta minus three cos theta equals nothing. I have a cos in common, so let's pull it out. Let's bring out a cosine theta. That leaves me, factor it out. That leaves me with two root three sine theta minus three equals zero. Now, fortunately, unlike the last one, uh, no frequency issues here. Everything is the way it should be. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Now, uh, what I have to do is I have to set each one equal to zero. So the first one's lovely. Cos theta equals zero means I inverse cosine both sides and theta is going to be the inverse cosine of zero. And the inverse cosine of zero happens at two spots, pi over two and three pi over two. So theta is pi over two and three pi over two. And again, don't have to worry about the weird period stuff that we saw before. Okay. Everything's exactly where it needs to be, hooray. Now the other one is gonna be a little less pleasant. Two root three sine theta minus three equals zero. Add three, two root three sine theta equals three. <sighs> Divide both sides by two root three. So you have sine theta equals three over two root three that's against the rules. So multiply the top and the bottom by root three and root three. Okay, that gives you sine theta equals three root three over six, which simplifies two root three over two. Ah, much nicer. Now you inverse sine both sides. And so the int, so theta is going to be the inverse sine of root three over two. So very similar to the last one, uh, the inverse sine of root three over two is pi over three and two pi over three. And that's the only two spots as long as the period is normal that you have to worry about between zero and two pi. So my final answer is going to be u 
and you all eight possibilities, all, all four possibilities. Yeah. Yeah, pretty awesome. All right, solve on the interval zero and two pi. I have sine squared theta equals sine theta plus one minus sine squared theta. Let's move everything to the left. Okay, so let's subtract sine theta. Let's subtract one. Let's add sine squared theta. That way it equals zero because I sense some factoring that's going to happen. If I add sine squared theta to sine squared theta, that gets me two sine squared theta minus sine theta minus one. Now, if you're looking at this and a little thought bubble pops in your head and you're thinking, bloop, 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 that's a thought bubble. A squared two, a squared minus a minus one factors out to two a plus one times a minus one. You're right. But instead of sine or instead of a, we have sine. So this factors out to two sine theta plus one regular sine theta minus one equals zero. Okay. And now you just set each one equal to zero and solve. Uh, so you would be two sine theta plus one equals zero. Subtract one sine two sine theta equals negative one. Divide by two sine theta equals negative one over two. Inverse sine, inverse sine. And the inverse sine of negative a half is 7 pi over 6 and 11 pi over 6. So theta is 7 pi over 6 and then the other side, which is 11 pi over 6. This one's a little bit friendlier. Sine theta minus 1 equals 0. Add 1. Uh, and so sine theta is going to equal 1, inverse sine, inverse sine. And that's only going to happen once at pi over 2. No. Yeah, pi over 2. Because it peaks out and won't happen again. And that's also because this is basically asking where on the unit circle is the y value uh, one. And that happens at like the 90 degree angle, which is pi over two. Uh, so there you go. Hello, 100%. I did it. All right, another one. I think maybe the last solving one. This one's actually not that bad. Cos squared theta, I've seen that before. I've seen that on cos squared theta plus sine squared theta equals one which means if I want to make you look more like you, what I can do is I can turn cos squared theta into one minus sine squared theta, which is what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and then what I will do is I will move everything to the right. So I will subtract one, add sine squared theta, subtract one, add sine squared theta, and it looks like I'm going to have myself a very, very, very similar problem to what I just did. Okay, I'm going to have zero, so I'll put it over here, equals sine squared theta uh, plus two sine theta plus one. Ah, a perfect square trinomial. That is sine theta plus one squared equals zero. So I don't have to do both. Sine theta plus one equals zero. Sine theta equals negative one. Inverse sine, both sides. And that gets me theta equals three pi over two. Now, no interval. 
So sine uh, of a theta is only going to be negative 1 once in the entire unit circle. So all we have to do is add 2 pi k to this, and then we've covered ourselves. So k is an integer. Well, we have more of these. I don't know why I put so many of these solving trig functions problems on this thing, but you know what? More time means more YouTube money in my pocket, baby. Now I can make about $40 a month. Let's, um, oh my gosh, let's, oh, I see it. I see it right away. We have ourselves a double angle formula. Now, uh, we saw these at the very beginning. Remember, it seems like long ago, but we saw these at the very beginning where we said that regular sine of two theta would be two sine cos theta. Okay, so this would be negative two sine theta cos theta. Mm -hmm. uh, similarly, we have, of course, nothing happens with root two sine theta. That's just normal. That's just normies. Uh, minus two four sine theta cos theta because two times two is this many. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add uh, 4 sine theta cos theta to both sides like so. And you know, what? while I'm at it, I'm not going to have all the space in the world. In fact, I'm not going to have any space in the world. I'm going to subtract root 2 sine theta from both sides as well. So everything is on the left. So that'll leave us with uh, 2 right? Two sine theta, cos theta. And if I subtract that from the right to the left, minus root two sine theta, set it equal to zero. All right, let's rip out a sine. Let's factor out a sine. And that's all I can factor out. I factored out the sine. Ace and ace. Minus root two, equals zero. So the first one's going to be the lovely one. That's going to be sine theta equals zero. Inverse sine both sides. Theta is going to equal the inverse sine of zero, which happens three times. It happens twice. Now, when I created this problem, see how, now this is where you would normally do it. You will be like zero and pi, you know, because of the whole unit circle thing. But since I included two pi with this, I got to include that two pi as well. So it's going to happen at zero pi and two pi. Oh, oh, Nicholas or goat or whatever. I don't know. That was me being silly. Uh, all right, so now I have 2 cos theta minus root 2 equals 0. Add root 2 is 2 cos theta equals root 2. Divide both sides by 2, and you have cos theta equals root 2 over 2. Inverse cosine both sides, and you have the inverse cosine of root 2 over 2 which is going to give me pi over equals pi over four as an option because it's the x values and it's positive. So pi over four and seven pi over four. Yes. So both of all, all five of my answers are going to be zero pi, two pi, pi over four, and seven pi over four. Great. 
Find the exact value of cosine pi over 12. Well, we're finally done solving trig equations, but now we're introducing a new layer of hell called the angle and difference trigonometric identities. You see, I don't know what cosine pi over 12 is, but you do know what? You do know what? If I, if I do a little bit of math magic, right? Put this over 12. Okay. I know what four pi, or I know what better yet, let's not say four pi. Let's say I know what pi over three is cosine of that. I know the cosine of pi over four. So if I were to do this and make this four pi minus three pi, this ends up being that. Now, this is an unnecessary step. This is me just going over my thinking process so I can show what I'm really doing. By splitting it up like that, I can now kind of split it up like this, right? So this becomes 4 pi over 12 minus 3 pi over 12, which turns it into cos pi over 3, something I know minus pi over four, something I know, okay? Um, cosine of pi over three minus cosine of pi over four. Now, um, when I had the difference formula in that one slide that I show you, like the third or fourth slide in, uh, let me see if I can fit it up here. Cos uh, alpha minus beta is the same exact thing as cos alpha cos beta with the cosines, it's the opposite of what you want. So plus sine alpha, sine beta. So this is going to end up being cos pi over three, cos pi over four, plus sine pi over three, sine pi over four. Cos pi over three is a half. Cos pi over four is root two over two. Plus sine pi over three is root three over two. Let's think about that one. And then sine pi over four is also root two over two. Because these guys uh, are also root two over two. <clears throat> so multiply these guys. One times root two is root two. Two times two is four plus root six over four. Add the fractions. Don't combine the roots because you're adding them and they're different and you can't simplify any of them. Leave it like that. That's the exact value. Okay. Not plugging anything into your calculator, which we will do at some point soon, I'm sure. Now, if memory serves me correctly, if we're doing the subtraction one with cosine next, then we're probably doing a sine one with addition, which we kind of are, and we are, and it's backwards. So if you look back, which I'm not gonna do because it's cheating, uh, when it was cosine and it was minus inside the parentheses, it was cos, cos plus sine, sine. This is sine, cos, cos, sine with a plus sign, which means that this is sine, alpha plus beta. So I'll call you alpha and I'll call you beta. So this is the same thing as sine pi over nine plus two pi over nine, pi over nine plus two pi over nine is three pi over nine. Three pi over nine simplifies out to pi over three, which gives me root three over two. It was backwards. I liked it a whole lot easier. A whole lot easier. The base of a tree is 150 feet from a mark on the ground. Check out these drawing skills. Here's a tree, it's red. The base of a tree is 150 feet from a mark on the ground. Let's actually make that on the ground and let's put a mark right here. Oh, hi, Mark. <laughs> the room. 
uh, the angle of elevation, which is wherever you are observing from, from that mark to the top of the tree is pi over three radians. So somebody is looking up there at the top of the tree and the angle is pi over three. Calculate the height of the tree. Now, geometry would tell you so katoa, which is good, good. Uh, and then you would think adjacent, opposite, tangent, good, good. I'm going to use more pre-calculus language, even though I already just used the geometry language and told you what to do. But if I view this, you know, as a X value because, you know, it's the, the horizontal distance. And if I view this as a Y value, which is the vertical distance, and if I don't care about the hypotenuse, which is the radius, then yeah, I am going to use tangent. And tangent of my uh, angle is going to equal the Y over X. And now it's just a matter of answering the question. Uh, tangent pi over three is equal to the Y value, which is H over the X value, which is 150. Okay. I don't remember what tan theta or tan pi over three is off the top of my head. So what I'll do is I'll quick change this to sine pi over three over cosine pi over three, because why the heck not? That's going to equal H over 150. Sine pi over three is root three over two. Cosine pi over three is a half. And that's gonna equal H over 150. So if I multiply the top and the bottom by two, that makes the half go away and that crosses out. So you have root three equals H over 150. Multiply both sides by 150. And the height is going to be 150 root 3, uh, feet. I don't think this is a calculator problem. <laughs> Good job drawing a box, stupid. Um, nope, no calculator, so we're going to leave it like that. Now, those of you who might kind of recognize this, all right, if you're good at geometry, even though we're pretending like we don't know it. But if you remember your 30, 60, 90 triangles, uh, pi over three is a 60 degree angle, which makes this a 30, 60, 90 triangle, which makes this, this by the way, uh, yeah, you would just divide it by root three. Um, and then this would be, if I cared about this would be 300 root three, but I don't care about that. I don't care about that. Trees. The Lorax, he speaks for them. Remember that guy? Uh-oh. There's my calculator. Oh, it's time. It's time. It's time. A man whose eyes are 6.1 feet off the ground is flying a kite. At a moment, the string of the kite is taut. Love that word. And is 143.2 feet long. The kite is that many feet off the ground. What is the angle of elevation? Well, let's draw a man. Look at him. He's flying a kite. Oh, the string is taut. That is a kite. Uh, there's the thing and then like ribbons or something. I don't, I don't fly kites anymore. It's 2024. No one flies kites. Uh, he is 6.1 feet off the ground. I'll get to that in a moment. At a moment, the string of the kite is taut and is 143.2 feet long. The kite is... 36.4 feet off the ground. Pew. He is 6.1 feet off the ground. Hmm. Uh, what is the angle of elevation? All right. <clears throat> so based off of this awful picture, this is what I have. I have a triangle. I have a theta. You don't change you do. Uh, we care about this angle right here. We know how high off the ground the kite is. Don't care about that. What I care about is how long this side is. And that side is going to be 96.4 minus 6.1, which is going to be 90.3. Okay, which I believe is a wrap station here in Southeast Pennsylvania. 
Now, um, if I were to try to do like Sokotoa again, I would be like, that's the opposite. And that's the hypotenuse sign. Or we could view this as R and we can view this as Y. And you would have uh, sine equals sine theta equals uh, Y over R, right? Okay, so sine theta is going to equal 90.3 over, it might be a Christian radio station. I don't know. Inverse sine both sides. Now I'm curious. Uh, inverse both sides. And so that's what I'm going to need my calculator for. I'm going to need my calculator to find the inverse sine of 90.3 over 143.2. So let's take a little break over and figure that out. All right, this will not take long, not at all. Uh, let's just make sure we're set to radians. We are, so quit out of that. Inverse sine is going to be second sine. And then we have to type out 90.3 uh, divided by 143.2. I guess we can close the parentheses because it's proper. Hit enter. And that's 0.6823, blah, 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 radians. So we'll round it to 0.682 radians. All right, Mr. Calculator, you have spoken 0 0.682. I've heard of blink 182, but 0 0.682, not the same at all. Radians, though, we're dealing with radians because that's what AP Precalculus deals with. Okay. All right. <clears throat> A pendulum ride is an amusement park. Don't I have a picture? Like, and my face is probably covering it. No. Okay. A pendulum ride is an amusement park attraction that rotates in complete circles. At phase two of the ride, the time in seconds can be modeled by the equation T equals 4.8 over pi inverse sine. Remember, arc sine is inverse sine. H minus 74.3 over 70.7 uh, in parentheses for H feet. How long after phase two begins does the height reach 100 feet? So what I need to do is I need to graph this guy in my calculator, and I'm going to also graph 100 in my calculator and see what I get. So I believe I made a stupid mistake and said before that I needed to graph this. I actually don't need to graph this. Um, I have this backwards. H is my height, and it tells me to find out when the time that this hits 100. So all I have to do is type in the original formula and replace that H with 100. So uh, 4.8 divided by pi, pi is second caret thingy, close it, inverse sine of, let's open up another set of parentheses because I'm always nervous, and this is where I get 100, 100 minus 74 point three close it and divide it by 70.7 and that'll get me my answer so no graphing needed for this one i i was wrong it's the first time for everything what do we get we get 0 0.5684 so we'll say 0 0.568 seconds not long at all all right 0 0.568 seconds didn't take long at all. Didn't take long at all. Solve T equals 4.8 pi arc sine of that function for H. All right, so I'm going to rewrite sine as inverse sine because it's the same exact thing. And while I'm at it, why don't I multiply both sides by pi over 4.8? So let's do that first. I'm going to multiply both sides by pi over 4.8, that allows those guys to go away. So pi t over 4.8 is going to equal the inverse sine of h minus 74.3 over 70.7, okay? Now to undo an inverse sine, 
what you do is regular sign. So if I regular sign both sides, which I don't have the space to write out, I get regular sine of pi t over 4.8. That equals h minus 74.3 over 70.7. The next step to get rid of the 70.7, multiply both sides to 70.7. That gives me 70.7 sine pi t over 4.8 equals h minus 74.3. One more step, add 74.3 to both sides, add 74.3 to both sides, okay? And I'm going to move h to the left. h equals 70.7 sine pi t over 4.8 plus 74.3. If phase two lasts 26.8 seconds, how many times is the height of 127.5 reached? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna graph this guy now. And I'm gonna also graph 127.5 and see how many times my sine function is going to cross 127.5 over the interval that I'm given right there, 26.8. All right, now I'm gonna do a little bit of the graphing. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna graph the function that I just came up with, 70.7 sine, uh, what do I have? Pi t, so pi second, that t is x, divide that by 4.8, so 4.8 close the parentheses, plus 74.3. Now that plus 74.3 represents a vertical shift, so I'm not gonna see anything when I hit graph. Oh, I stand corrected. But I don't see what I really want to see, um, which was the other side of the mountain. I think that's a song. Uh, but anyway, I care about what's going on for the first 26.8 seconds. So, and I also care, what, the other magic number is what? Uh, how many times is it 127.5? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change my window. So I need to go to 26.8. So we'll make it 0 to 26.8. Because I don't really need to find the intercepts. Was it 26.8? Let me go back and check. 26.8. 26.8. And then we'll bump this up to 200. Okay. And then what I'm also going to do is I'm going to graph the fact that we're hitting the height of 127.5. So I'm going to go down to 127.5. And this will give me how, that's an 8. This will give me the amount of times my sine graph is going to hit that line. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So that's my answer. Six. Name an interval where the height is decreasing. So let's go to my calculator and find that out. All right, so to find a decreasing interval, I got rid of the other part that I was dealing with. What I want to do is I want to find one of these. Okay, so from here to here, or from here to here, or from here to here. Let's do the first one because why not? Second calc. Uh, maximum will allow me to find where it begins decreasing. So uh, let's move to the left just a little bit, hit enter. Let's move to the right a little bit, hit enter. And by hitting enter again, it gives me a maximum value of, what is that, 2.4? Oh, 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 oh. So we'll say 2.4. Now it starts decreasing here up until we hit that minimum value. So why don't we find out what that minimum va minimum value minimum value is? So second, calc. Let's find the minimum value three. Let's go to the right a bit. Let's hit enter. Let's go to the right some more. Let's hit enter. Let's hit enter again, and that gets me seven point one nine 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 nine, which is seven point two. So one of my options, and there's two others, is we're decreasing between two point four seconds and 7.2 seconds.
That was a doozy. By the way, fun fact, I have the flu. I did this whole video while having the flu. That's how much I care about you guys and your education. I love you. Thanks for watching all my videos. Please continue to do so. Um, one more of these and then that'll do it for unit three. So fun stuff. Thanks for watching as always. Have a blessed day. Bye. This is the end. My only friend, the end of unit three and technically AP pre-calculus because we only do the first three units on the test. So that's exciting news. Today we're gonna to talk about polar graphs and polar coordinates and polar bears. <laughs> that's just a joke. I'm just joshing you guys. We're not gonna really talk about polar bears or are we? What we are gonna talk about is polar coordinates versus rectangular coordinates. You're used to rectangular coordinates. Rectangular coordinates are given to you as X, Y. Uh, like for example, the point four eight means you go right four, you go up eight, you put a dot there, easy peasy lemon squeezy. Polar coordinates though are given to you as something completely different, R and theta. R is going to be where you draw your dot compared to zero, zero on a polar graph. Now zero, zero is also called the pole. So if R is three, you're not going like right three, you're going to count three units away and get ready to draw the dot. Where do you draw that dot? Well, your theta is gonna tell you where you draw that dot. See, theta is the same theta that it's been all unit long. If you were to go counterclockwise from the right positive axis, or in this case, zero, uh, if I tell you to draw the point three pi over two, then you go to pi over two and you draw the dot one, two, three units away, simple. Now, what if I wanna switch between the two? If I want to turn something that is rectangular into polar, okay, like into polar, what I do is in order to turn my xy into r theta form, the r is going to be found by taking the square root of x squared plus y squared. And if you're like, that's kind of like Pythagorean theorem, it sure is because your radius is basically you taking the x and the y value and finding your radius, which is kind of like your hypotenuse. To find your theta, you're going to inverse tan the y over x, which again comes very much from so Katoa and stuff like that. So that's how you would turn something that's rectangular into polar. How do you turn something that's polar into rectangular? Well, it's a little bit friendlier, I guess. R is going to be, or the y value is going to be r cos theta, which should look familiar. The y value is going to be r sine theta, which should look familiar. So if I gave you, what's the point that I used? I think I said three pi over two or something. Let's just say I wanted you to graph uh, three pi over four, okay? This tells you how far away you're gonna draw that dot from zero, zero, and this tells you where you're gonna do it. Pi over four lives there. Here's zero, zero. One, two, three, put a dot there. Now, what would that look like on a regular XY plane? Well, let's turn polar into rectangular by doing three cos pi over four and three sine pi over four. Okay, cos pi over four is root two over two. So this becomes three root two over two or three root two over two and sine pi over four is also root two over two. So this also becomes three root two over two. And if you were to run to your calculator and find out what three root two over two is and pretend that you're gonna draw that on an X, Y coordinate plane, you would land somewhere up here, which is gonna be the equivalent to that guy over there, which no one said anything. I put my dot at the wrong spot. It should be right there because I said pi over four. This whole time I could have been wrong. move on to the next thing. All right, I moved my face because now we're talking about complex numbers and polar coordinates. 
Now, a complex number involves imaginary numbers. Complex numbers are usually given to us in the form a plus bi. So let me give you an example of a complex number. 2 plus 2i. If I wanted to graph a complex number on a complex number plane, it's very similar to a rectangular plane. You would basically say, you are the real number, so let's go right to on the real axis, and you are the complex or imaginary number, so let's go up to on the imaginary axis and put a dot at what appears to be 2, 2. Now, if I wanted to link this to what polar coordinates look like, it's going to be very different. A polar coordinate that is also complex is in this form, r cos theta plus i r sine theta. And you might look at this and say, well, wait a minute, r cos theta is like the x value and r sine theta is like the y value. So that's, and when we graph this, that was basically the x value and that was basically the y value. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, now you're getting it. By the way, other teachers might write it out like this where they factor out the r. It's the same exact idea, but you know, it all depends on the teacher that you might have. Uh, it's the same, it's all the same. Don't be surprised if you see either option. Now this was the uh, complex number form. What if I wanna make this polar? Well, we're gonna do what we did in the other slide but kind of opposite, where I believe I gave you polar and we turned it rectangular. Now I'm giving you something that looks more rectangular and we're gonna turn it polar. Okay, so when I did that in the previous slide, what I wrote down is in order to find the magnitude, the R, is we would take this square root of X squared plus Y squared. Well, now we're viewing it as A squared plus B squared. And if you're like, is it really, isn't it just the same thing? It is, you're my A, you're my B, which is basically like an X, which is basically like a Y. So we would say that R is going to be two squared plus two squared. R is going to be four plus four. R is gonna be the square root of eight. And you can clean that up by making that two root two. Now, what we saw in the last slide is in order to get the theta version of it, we would take the inverse tangent of y over x. Well, I don't have y over x, but it's the same exact idea if we said b over a. Okay, and that gets us our theta. Now, in this case, to save some room, uh, b over a is 2 over 2, so the inverse tangent of 2 over 2 is the same thing as the inverse tangent of 1. The inverse tangent of 1, we technically have two answers, but since this guy lives in quadrant 1, we only care about the quadrant 1 answer, which is pi over 4. So my theta is pi over 4, my r is 2 root 2. So in order to take these two pieces of information and make it look like one of those, I'm going to, and I'm going to make it look like the blue one because I use that much more often. I'm going to say that this complex number written as a polar coordinate is now going to look like 2 root 2 cosine theta, which is pi over 4, plus 2 root 2. Let's attach an i there, not inside the square root because that wouldn't make sense. Sine pi over 4. And what that would look like graphically on a polar coordinate is you would imagine what 2 root 2 is. So, you know, 2 point something, 3 point something, I actually don't know the answer. And then you would go to where pi over 4 is in that direction. And if this was a polar graph, you would count out 2 root 2 and put a dot there, which would kind of equate to that. Okay. All right. Fun. All right, using trig graphs or tables to make polar graphs. Now, I, you can memorize what polar graphs look like when graphing polar graphs. And, and we'll kind of talk about what they could possibly look like as we do problems here. But to me, the best way to draw out a polar graph is to me either make a trigonometry graph, like on a regular rectangular plane, or to draw out a table on a rectangular plane uh, using the information that you have. Okay. So let's just say that I gave you something like 
three, let's say I want you to graph on a rectangular or on a polar graph, R equals three cosine theta, okay? And I want to graph that. A very quick way of doing this, and, under, and keep in mind too, AP Precalculus is going to have a lot of multiple choices. So if, if this is a multiple choice problem, this will be a lot faster than what you expect. But if I were to go and draw the whole thing out, this is how I would do it, okay, quickly. And we will do a lot of these, so don't worry. But a very basic way of doing this is you know that 3 cos theta is going to be up 1, 2, 3, down 1, 2, 3. Cosine goes like this and stops right there. Regular frequency, so at 2 pi. So it bottoms out at regular pi, at half a pi is where we hit zero, at three pi over two is where we hit zero again, okay? And then we repeat the process. So maybe we draw the points that we know, okay? At zero, three, I can go over here and say, all right, well, when theta is zero, I have three, so the magnitude is three. So we go over here, and where theta is zero, we have a magnitude of one, two, three, and we put a dot there. Then let's put a dot at zero on pi over two. Okay. Now, what this is going to look like graphically, okay, what this is going to look like graphically so far is as I go from the angle zero to pi over two, my magnitude is getting smaller. So what's happening is as I go from zero to pi over two, I am going towards this dot. So this is being created. Let me do a better job. Let me do a better job. One more time. As I'm going from three, as I'm going from the angle zero to pi over two, my magnitude is getting smaller according to this picture here. So I'm creating more like a circle because I'm now heading towards zero, okay? As I go from pi over two to pi, I'm hitting negative three. So pi is negative three. So if pi is negative three, usually regular three would be over one, two, three right here. But if it's negative three, it's over there. So I'm literally creating a circle again. And then as I go from pi to 3 pi over 2, it's the negatives. So I'm creating that circle. Okay. And as I go from 3 pi over 2, I'm hitting pi again. So this should be a little bit more circular. So let me clean this up a little bit. This should be a lot more circular. But basically, by using this picture... I am able to draw out what this graph looks like, which is just supposed to be a circle, which I just simply cannot draw. Much better. Okay? All right. Not pretty, but we'll do more. Let's jump into some problems. Given the complex number, graph on an imaginary axis. All right. If I remember what an imaginary axis looks like, okay, uh, let me scooch this up. Let me scooch this up because I know exactly where this is going to live. This is my real axis right here. This is my imaginary axis right here. The real number is five. So one, two, three, four, five. The imaginary number is negative five. So one, two, three, four, five in the negative area. And we get a dot right there. Okay. Okay. Rewrite in the form R cos theta plus I R sine theta. All right, so very much what we did a couple slides ago. I need to label U A and label U B, and R is going to become the square root of A squared plus B squared. So R is going to equal, big square root, 5 squared plus negative 5 squared. Don't worry. This is going to become 25 plus 25, which is going to become 50, which is going to become factor out of 5, 5 root 2. So that's the R. The way we find the theta, 
and my lights just turned off in my room, is the inverse tangent of B over A, Y over X. In this case, the inverse tangent of negative 5 over regular 5, which simplifies out to the inverse tangent of negative 1. Now, the inverse tangent of negative 1 has two possible answers, one that lives up here or one that lives down there. We want the one that lives down there, which means we are going to have an angle measure of 7 pi over 4. Took me a second there. So putting this all together, we can write out 5 root 2 cos 7 pi over 4 plus 5 root 2 i sine 7 pi over 4. Given the polar coordinate 3, 5 pi over 6, graph the polar coordinate. Easy. 3 is your magnitude, okay? 3 is how far away from the pole, 0, 0, you're going to put that dot. So 1, 2, 3, or 1, 2, 3, whatever. 5 pi over 6 is going to be the direction that you do that in. So let's locate 5 pi over 6, and let's count out 1, 2, 3, and that's how you graph that. To write that in rectangular form, rectangular form is found by doing r cos theta, very familiar, r sine theta. r is 3, theta is 5 pi over 6, so 3 cos 5 pi over 6, 3 sine 5 pi over 6, Cosine pi over 6, let me see, we're over here, is going to be negative root 3 over 2. All right, yep, <clears throat> 3 times negative root 3 over 2. And sine pi over, 5 pi over 6 is going to be a half, positive a half. So 3 times a half. So simplify this out. And you get negative 3 root 3 over 2 and 3 over 2. So if you were graphing that on a rectangular plane, you would go whatever number that is left that many up a little bit. And you'll have a dot there, which would, uh, you know, if you were to glue that on top of the other would look just like that. All right. All right, another wardrobe change. It's 6.30 a.m. in Norristown, Pennsylvania. I'm about to do some polar graphing. Wish me luck. Graph this polar coordinate, negative 4 pi over 3. All right. Well, this is my magnitude. This over here, right here where I'm drawing that R, and that is going to be the angle that I use. Usually what I do is I go to that pi over 3, which is somewhere around here, and I would draw at 4. Mm. But this is negative 4. So what this means is I go to pi over 3, and I go in the opposite direction, 4. So I go down 4 pi over 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, and I put the dot there. So a negative magnitude means I go to that angle and I spin my magnitude in the opposite direction than what I'm used to. So basically, if I wanted to, I could rewrite this guy as regular 4, add pi to that, and it would be 4 pi over 3, and it would be the same exact thing. <clears throat> so graphed. Now, to rewrite that in rectangular form, I'm going to use the old r cos theta, r sine theta thingamathing, and plug in what I know. It doesn't matter which one of these I use because they're the same thing. So let's just use the negative original version. So negative 4 cos pi over 3, negative 4 
sine pi over three, cosine pi over three is a half, so negative four times a half, and sine pi over three is root three over two. So since I'm running out of space, let me just write this all in one thing. Negative four times a half is negative two. No overthinking there. Uh, negative four over two is negative two up top, so negative two root three. So if you were to graph this on a rectangular plane, you know, rectangular planes look like this. You would go left two, down negative two and a third, or root three, whatever that looks like. You'll have a dot right there, which correlates to that dot right there, as if you were to draw an X, Y axis right there through the pole. Fun. All right, things get a little hectic here. Now, I'm going to do exactly what the directions ask me to do and draw this by making a table. When I'm done, I will explain kind of like a shortcut to do this where maybe it won't help with drawing, but it will help with identifying like on a multiple choice test and that would make life a little bit easier. Okay, so at the end of this problem, I'm going to compare four sine two theta to a sine or cosine and theta. We'll get there. Right now, I want to graph this by making a table. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to graph... I'm going to make a table. It's going to look like this. Hopefully, I give myself enough space. Hopefully, I gave myself enough space. Um, I'm, I'm graphing all the way from zero to uh, theta to two pi. The fact that there's a two in front of theta means that things halfway through start to repeat. Since the frequency is two, that means things start to repeat themselves halfway through. Okay, so by putting a two in front of pi, that cuts my normal period of two pi in half because two pi over two. So again, things repeat themselves. So I probably, you know, if I put a theta here, I'm gonna use every single number here all the way up through pi. And if I have space, I'll maybe even do the extra one. So uh, I'm gonna start at zero, pi over 12, pi over six, pi over four, pi over three, 5 pi over 12, pi over 2, 7 pi over 12, uh, 2 pi over 3, 3 pi over 4, 5 pi over 6, 11 pi over 12, and pi, and I barely just made it. And at that pi, though, I'm going to see the repeating process take place. Uh, what I'm going to do in the middle here is I'm going to write out 4 sine 2 theta, and I'm going to allow this to be an area where I do a little bit of calculations. In other words, 4 sine 2 theta is going to be 4 sine 2 times 0, which is 0. And then I'll figure out what that math is over here when I get to it. Uh, this becomes 4 sine 2 times pi over 12 is pi over 6. 4 sine 2 times pi over 6 is pi over 3. 4 sine 2 times pi over 4 is pi over 2. And again, as we do these, these are now more manageable things that we can deal with. We, we know that we can do all of these signs. We just have to multiply four uh, when we're done them. Uh, four sine two times pi over three is two pi over three. Four sine two times five pi over 12 is five pi over six. Four sine 2 times pi over 2 is pi. 4 sine 2 times 7 pi over 12 is 7 pi over 6. 
4 sine 2 times 2 pi over 3 is 4 pi over 3. 4 sine 2 times 3 pi over 4 is 3 pi over 2. 4 sine 2 times 5 pi over 6 is 5 pi over 3. 4 sine 2 times 11 pi over 12 is 11 pi over 6. 11 pi over 6. And 2 times pi is 2 pi, which is the same as 0. Time to do some math. Time to do some math. Sine 0 is... 0. So 4 sine 0 is 0. Sine of pi over 6 is a half. So 4 sine of a half is 2. Okay. Uh, this becomes 2 root 3. This becomes 1. So 4. This becomes, oh, no way, 2 root 3. Okay, because it's root 3 over 2. 4 times root 3 over 2 is 2 root 3. Uh, this becomes a half, 2. Uh, sine of pi is 0. So 4 times 0 is 0. This is negative a half, so negative 2. This is negative root 2 over 3. So, no, this is negative root 3 over 2. So that would be negative 2 root 3. Uh, this is negative 1. Yep. So, uh, yep. Yeah, it took me a second there. So that's negative 4. And some of you might be able to see the pattern forming. Uh, this is negative 2 root 3 because it's the same as this. Uh, this becomes negative 2 because it's negative a half, and now we're back to 0 again. And then it repeats the process, it repeats the process, it repeats the process. So from here to here, we get these gross numbers, and then if we were to write all the way back around, you would literally just cover uh, the numbers that you would have. So I think we're all right. I think we're all right, but we'll see. Let's let's graph what we have. Zero, zero is a dot in the middle. Okay. Uh, you, as we move around, you go to two. Okay. Two root three is going to be like somewhere around here-ish. Okay, and then we hit 4, and then 2 root 3 again, and then 5 pi over 12 is 2. Okay, uh, then we hit 0, and then for you, we're at negative 2, so that's going to be here. Okay, and then negative 2 root 3 puts me around here, and then negative uh, 4 is going to put me right around here. Negative 2 root 3 puts me around here, and then negative 2 puts me around here, and then back to 0. Now, as we go for the rest of them, we use these same exact numbers in this order. So pi is 0. 13 pi over 12 would be 2. Okay, so here. And then that 2 root 3, and then that 4, and then that 2 root 3, and then that 2, and back to 0. And then here... Here at 19 pi over 12, we would be at negative 2. So that would put me here at regular 2. And then at 2 and a half ish, did I go too far? No. And then at 4 ish. 
and then at like three and a half ish, not two and a half ish, uh, and then at two again, and then back to zero. So the 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 direction and the trip that I took around this whole thing had me start here. Okay, loop around here. Okay. And then continue my path around here. And continue my path around here. And then continue my path around here. Now that was the long way of doing this, okay? That was the long way of doing this and it took some time. But what we created here was a rose. And a rose is something that looks like this form. Now, here's something that you can memorize for when you have to deal with this stuff. Uh, um, without having to draw it out. Like for, for example, if I see this, I now know what this looks like, and I know what all of the other A sine and thetas look like. They're gonna look like flowers, okay? When N is even, when N is even, what's gonna happen is you're gonna have two N petals. In other words, in other words, since I have a uh, 2N, I created a rose with four petals. If this was 3N, well, hold on. If, the, if N was six, I'd have 12 petals. If N was four, I'd have eight petals, so on and so forth. Now, if N is even or odd, I would have that many petals. When it's sign, when it's sign, okay, the, the flowers do not go through, they don't start here. When it's cosine, the flowers would start here because of the fact that cosine starts at like zero one, or in this case, it would be zero four. Okay, so a sign would be literally the exact same flower with the petals going through the major axes. But since this is a sine to N, we can expect having the flowers or having the petals go through like the diagonal axes and have two times more petals than that number there. So that's like the shortcut, multiple choice way of doing a problem like this. Pretty intense. Pretty intense. Now, knowing what we know and, and knowing what we just said, Okay, when it was, when it was sine, what was it, four theta? Okay, we had a flower, I'm sorry, sine two theta. We had four petals and it looked like this. That's awful. Uh, now that we know that this is cosine, we can expect three petals where the one petal is going to live right there. And so probably have something that looks something like this. That's what we can expect where these go out to six. That's what we can expect. So if this was a multiple choice question and we see a picture where there's a pedal there, a pedal there, and a pedal diagonally here, that's gonna be our guy. But that's not what it's asking us to do right here. So what I am gonna do is I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go too crazy. I, I mean, I am gonna use since I know I'm gonna get three petals, maybe I can just make my life a little bit easier and um, uh, only do, well, we'll see how many I can do. Let's see how many I can do. Let's, let's make a table again. Okay, let's make a table again. We have theta, we have six cos three theta, and we have r. So let's choose zero, let's choose pi over 12. At some point, 
around here, I can expect repeating to take place. So maybe I stop at three pi over four if I have room for it. Let's do pi over six, pi over four, pi over three, five pi over 12, uh, pi over two, seven pi over 12, two pi over three, and three pi over four is basically all the room that I have anyway. And that's when we will start seeing things repeat itself, okay? Six cos three times zero is zero. Six cos three times pi over 12 is pi over four. Six cos three times pi over six is pi over two. Six cos three times pi over four is three pi over four. Six cos three times pi over three is pi. So we're halfway through. Six cos three times five pi over 12 is five pi over four. I don't know why that took me so long. Maybe it's because it's 6.50 a.m. Six cos three pi over two. Almost there. Six cos seven pi over four. Six cos two pi. So zero. So now we start repeating. So this will be the same thing as six cos pi over four. All right. Okay, cosine zero is one, so six times one is six. Cosine pi over four uh, is going to be pi over two. No, uh, 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 root two over two. So this becomes root two over three. You're zero. You're negative, so negative root two over three. You're negative one, so negative six. You're negative root two over three. Uh, you're zero. Your regular root two over three. And then the process repeats. So six root two over three. All right. So <clears throat> six, zero, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Root two over three is really small, like point something, like ugh, like right here, okay? Zero. And then at uh, pi over four, which is u, you're at negative root two over three. So uh, pi over four. Okay, and then at pi over three, we're at negative six, and then come back down to here, and then zero, and then seven pi over 12 is here, and then two pi over three is six here, and then wrap back around. So basically, oh, and I need, I have one more. I have, um, oh no, I'm good. All right. Oh, I do have one more. It's going to, it's going to happen right here. Okay. All right. So I start out here. And then I wrap around. Oh gosh. Oh golly. Oh my gosh, by golly. It's Christmas song. Yeah, so definitely not the prettiest thing in the world. But uh, it is a rose. It's a three-petal rose. It's supposed to be... This rose, this petal looks awful. I should have moved it around a little bit more 
more so that it looks more like this. But again, you know, you guys aren't paying me for my art skills. You're not paying me at all. But I do get money. I do get money, as rappers like to say. So, here's my three petal rose, just as I predicted. But again, like, you know, I would look at something like this and say, like, it's a, it's a three petal rose because you're odd. I know it starts on the X axis because it's cosine. So it's not gonna, it's, it's gonna be, you know, rotationally symmetrical. So I, I should expect if you're gonna have a rose here, you know, it's kind of like a sideways Mercedes symbol or Mitsubishi or whatever car you like. Because <laughs> I don't know anything about cars. Uh, windmill, fan, fan blade, fan blade symbol. All right. All right. Now, now that we've made a couple polar graphs by making tables, maybe this is less tedious. Maybe, maybe not. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to sketch what this looks like on a regular coordinate plane and find a way to translate that on a polar graph. So let me do that right now. We have two plus four cos theta. Now, cos theta has a regular period of two pi, so that's good news. But this amplitude and the fact that we're adding two to it tells me we have a vertical shift with a positive two change. So we're gonna, we're gonna have a midline here at two, and I'm really not going to give myself enough space. So let's go one, two, three, four, five, six. That should do it. One, two, three, four. That's going to overdo it. Let's add one more for funsies. And we're going to have like a midline here at regular two. Okay. Um, the period is two pi, like I said before. So that's going to happen. Magic's going to happen at pi. And then we have three pi over two and pi over two and yada, yada, yada. The amplitude is four, which means normally at cosine, we start at one. And in this case, we'd start at four. But since we're adding two to everything, we're going to start way up here at one, two, three, four, five, six. Is this six, two, three, four, five, six? And then we're going to hit our midline at pi over two. We're gonna bottom out at negative two at pi, hit our midline again at three pi over two and start the process at two pi. So me, 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 drawing a bunch of dots because it looks better than trying to draw for real because I'm sloppy. Now let's label what we know. Uh, at zero, I'm at six. So here's zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, at pi over two, I'm at two. So here's pi over two and here's two. Uh, at pi, I'm at negative two. So here's pi, negative two is gonna live right there. And at three pi over two, which is this guy, I'm at two, so one, two. Okay, so what's going to happen is as I'm normally on a regular trig graph on this picture, as I move towards pi over two, my number goes closer to that two value. So here I am, my number is going to go closer to that two value. So basically we have a picture that kind of looks like this. Okay, now this is where it gets weird. At some point after pi over two, I hit zero. So this is going to happen then I hit negative land, and then I finally hit that guy right there. So this pattern continues, and I create this weird curl going in. Okay, now that I'm at pi and negative two, I'm going to start moving closer to zero and eventually hit that two. So the opposite 
happens here. Okay. And very similarly to what I saw over here, now that I'm at pi 3 pi over 2 at 2, I am moving further away and hitting that 6 value. So this is going to kind of create like a circular looking thing here. And I'm going to have this. Now what I have, and if you are somebody who speaks French, uh, I apologize for what's going to happen. But what I have here is a that is like a weird C with a curve on it. Now, I don't speak French. I think it means heart, but I don't know. In America, we call this a cardioid because it kind of looks like a heart. It kind of does. I don't know. But what makes this special from the other two is the fact that I added a number to it. So the number that I add, the number that I could subtract, is going to make this guy look like a specific type of cardioid or le maison. Uh, there's ones that's more of like what's called a dimpled version. And then you have this version. It all depends on what number this is and what number that is that'll tell you what you're going to get. Okay, but these are examples of what polar graphs could look like. All right, now that we have a little experience graphing these things the old-fashioned way, let's try to memorize what they look like. At the very beginning, we graphed a circle. I believe it was something like 3 cosine theta, and it ended up looking like a circle over here. First things first, a circle is going to be something in the form r equals some number times either sine or cosine. Okay, sines open up here. Okay, if this a was negative it would open down here. Now we'll explore that. What does the A do? Well, if I make the A bigger, it just makes my circle bigger. Okay, if I make the A bigger, it makes my circle bigger. If A was negative, it shows up down there. What if this was cosine? All right, well, let's change that. Let's change this to cosine. And now it shows up lefty-righty instead of uppy-downy. So a negative cosine appears on the left and a positive cosine appears on the right. And I think we did something like three cosine theta to start out the day. I don't remember. I don't remember. Now, what if I were to take a number and multiply it to theta? Well, let's see. If the number is one, we have that circle still. As the number increases, things explode. Now, we're not gonna worry about decimals, not unless we're using a calculator. When it's even, as you know, we double up on the amount of petals that we get. When it's odd, we get the same amount of petals. So something like, you know, three cos three theta has a rose with three petals on it. If I turn cosine into sine, it kind of shifts a little bit. And instead of starting here on the positive x-axis, it starts up here now. Okay, and as I make n larger, so now it's even again, I have eight petals. If I make it five, it now has five petals. If I make, make it negative, ooh, it's upside down. And the A just determines whether or not I have something that's bigger or smaller. It's my magnitude. Now, let's bring this back down to one, make it a circle, and let's take a look at the <clears throat> Limousin version of it. If I were to take like one and add one to this, there it is. It makes that Limousin. What if I make it two? It makes it bigger. What if I made A and made that smaller? It becomes the dimpled version where now it's more of a heart instead of the weird loopy looking thing, which I believe is called a looped limeson, and that's a dimpled limeson. So turning into sine would make it look, I'm sorry, it is sine. Turning it into cosine would make it the sideways version. And there you have it. Okay, so you're looking at three different versions of these things, and we looked at all of them. Something that's a circle is going to be, you know, five sine theta. 
something that's going to be a rose is going to be like three sine five theta. And if I add a number to it, that's where we get the <clears throat> Limassol. All right, now that I'm done graphing those guys, for now, I think, uh, let's do something a little different. Trace the part of the graph that covers just one part of the interval. So I have R equals eight sine four theta. So four theta gives me the eight petals. That eight tells me that this goes out to eight, which appears to make sense. Um, you know, it checks out checks out. I care about tracing the part between uh, pi and 3 pi over 2. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to approach this a little differently. I'm going to graph this guy out. Now, what this means by having the 4 in front of it is my period is going to be 2 pi over 4, which means my period is half a pi. So whatever this does is going to repeat four times every two pi or every half a uh, pi. Now, I only care about the stuff that happens between pi, which is u, and three pi over two, which is u. Now, normally I'd start, you know, at, at zero, zero, and then I'd go up to eight, and down and repeat the process. Up to eight and then down and then repeat the process. But since I only care about this, I'm gonna to try to draw this out to the best that I can. Go up to eight, down, repeat. So between pi and three pi over two, I start at zero at pi. So here I am at pi, okay, there's my pi, I'm starting at zero. As I go towards three pi over two, what's happening is I'm going out to eight, then coming back. And then normally here, I'd go like this, but now I'm in negative land. So what's gonna happen is I'm starting at pi. We're in positive land according to my picture. I go out to eight. So let me make this a little bit bigger. I go out to eight. Let me make this a little bit bigger. I go out to eight, right? And then I hit zero. Now on the picture, here I am. As I continue, now I'm in negative territory, which means not here, but instead here. And that is me tracing. So that is me tracing from pi to three pi over two, this little green area. I traced it. Or for my Spanish speaking friends, I threed it. That's three different languages we have going on in this one. We had French, we had Spanish, and now we have English. And it's gonna stay that way. Uh, because I'm not that talented. Let's get the pen back to normal. Plot on a complex plane. Well, this is a complex polar point. The old CPP. Uh, what this says is I have a magnitude of two and I go to four pi over three, which is U, and I go positive two in that direction. One, two, there. That's what it looks like. The absolute value, if given a point on a complex plane or a point in general, is the distance from the pole, the pole, the pole to that point. Well, if I give it to you in complex form, the absolute value is just simply the magnitude. If I give you something in polar form, the magnitude is your absolute value. Absolute value just means distance. So if I give you something in rectangular form, the distance might mean something else like using Pythagorean theorem or the distance formula. But in this case, it's just the magnitude. So writing this in rectangular form is me accidentally doing what I kind of said we would do. All right, now in rectangular form, what you're gonna do to find out your number is you're going to do, and again, it looks like this, A plus B I. Okay, that's the rectangular form of a complex number because we have that I there. The A is going to be R cos theta. So two 
cos 4 pi over 3. My b is going to be r sine theta 2 sine 4 pi over 3. Okay. So my a is going to be 2 times cos pi over, or 4 pi over 3, which is negative root 2 over 2. Okay, and we can kind of see that down there. We can kind of see that it's, since it's in the middle of everything, the numbers seem to make sense. So these cross out and you end up with negative root 2. Okay, let me scooch that up. So a is negative root 2. A is negative root 2. Now the B is going to basically be the same thing. And since the numbers seem to check out, this is going to be 2 times negative root 2 over 2. So B is going to also be negative root 2. Now putting this all together and wrapping it up in a little bow, I need to make it look like this. So we are looking at, and let me put it up here, negative root 2 minus i root 2. Okay, which means, you know, we would go left like 1 point something and down 1 point something, and that seems to check out. Root 2 is 1 point something. And that seems to be exactly what we need. Ugh. Find the distance from the pole, the origin, to the point on the curve when theta is pi over 4. So there's that formula. Not too bad. I know I owed it before, but it's not too bad. And all we're going to do is plug in pi over 4 and do a little bit of math. So r of pi over 4 is going to be 2 plus 3 cosine pi over 4. Cosine pi over 4 is root 2 over 2, so 2 plus 3 times root 2 over 2. 2 plus root 3 over 2, and, and I'm going to leave it like that. There's zero reason why I need to combine that into one term, so, uh, so that's that. Find the values of theta where there's a maximum value. Now, I, I now kind of know what this picture is going to look like on a polar graph. But for me, I visualize these better on the regular old trig graph. It's the same thing. If this guy, if, if this guy, and I kind of know what the maximum is going to be. I know at some point cosine theta is going to equal 1. So at some point, I'm going to get 2 plus 3 times 1 is 5. At some point, I'm going to get 5. So this is what I would rather do. I know what cosine looks like. I know what cosine looks like. And again, now that I kind of said that out in my head, I really don't need to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. I know that this is going to be vertical shift of 2, so it's going to have a midline at 2 here. It has an amplitude of 3, so it's going to go up to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It's going to bottom out at negative 1, and since there's no horizontal shift, it's going to start at 0, 5. And it's going to go down and hit and then repeat itself at 2 pi. Okay. So common sense would tell me that again, at some point, and right now close your eyes and either visualize this, which means you don't have to close your eyes, or visualize the polar graph. At some point, you know your maximum is going to be 5. When's that going to happen? Well, that's going to happen when cosine of theta is 1. When is cosine theta equal to 1? At 1 and only 1 spot. 0. But since I'm including 2 pi, it's going to happen at 2 pi as well. So my maximum values are going to happen at 0. So theta equals 0 and theta equals 2 pi. Okay? So whether, again, you view that on a polar graph, and I think this picture is going to look something like this. Okay? That's going to happen right here at the very beginning. Which is a very good place to start. Sound of Music which I believe took place in Germany. 
I think, which I believe the German word for no is nine. It's a shame we didn't have any problems that involved the number nine. There's still time, but nine. No calculator? No, no calculator. I move my face at everything just to find out that there's no calculator. But again, re we really don't need one. Find the average rate of change on that interval right there. Now, it's going to be ugly, but we don't need a calculator for it. Okay, the average rate of change for a polar function is the exact same process for the average rate of change that you saw back in unit one. The average rate of change is if I have f of b minus f of a or r of b minus r of a, you put that over b minus a. So if I called you a and I called you b, then what I need to do is find out what r of 5 pi over 4 minus r of pi over 2 is over 5 pi over 4 minus pi over 2. So I'm going to step to the side here and just, you know, take my time because I'm going to need the space and show what r of 5 pi over 4 is. And then I'll do r of pi over 2 directly underneath that. Okay, so we're going to have 2 plus 3 cos 5 pi over 4. 5 pi over 4 is quadrant 3, so that's negative root 2 over 2. So 2 plus 3 times negative root 2 over 2. So 2 minus 3 root 2 over 2 when you multiply them together. And let's leave it like that just in case something magical happens in this process right here. Now let's find out what r of pi over 2 is. Pi over 2, how nice. Why? Well, 3 cos pi over 2 is going to be 2. Why? Well, because cos pi over 2 is 0. So now that I have this information... I can replace r of 5 uh, pi over 4 with 2 minus 3 root 2 over 2 in an unnecessary parentheses. So let me just get rid of that parentheses. Now we're going to minus uh, r of pi over 2, which is just 2. So if I had more there, then I'd want the parentheses, but don't need it. Uh, why don't I change this to 2 times 2? So I can have 5 pi minus 2 pi <clears throat> over 4. Now I can combine them. 2 minus 2 go away. So I have negative 3 root 2 over 2 all over 3 pi over 4. Let's multiply the top and the bottom by 4 over 3 pi to get rid of the 3 pi over 4 on the bottom. U2 simplify out to 1 and 2. U3s go away, and that leaves me with negative 2 root 2 over pi. For which polar function does the limit of theta approach infinity of that polar function equal zero? I have three polar functions right here. Okay, I need to find the one where the limit equals zero. Well, if this was chapter one and I had thetas at the top and thetas at the bottom and whatever, I would only focus on the first term of each. Right? So you would be theta squared over theta, which is theta. And if I plug in infinity, I get infinity. So not you. Does the same rules apply here? Yes. 
So this becomes infinity, so it's not you. Uh, you become two root theta over, or two theta to the fourth over theta to the fourth. You cancel out, you become two. Can't really plug in infinity because there's nothing to plug it into, so I get two. So not you. You're my leading term, you're my leading term. So you become one over theta to the fourth power. If I plug in infinity, these I'm going to get like one over a really, 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 really big number, which is like 0.00000. Oh, it's zero. You're my guy. Ah, makes sense. Okay. Limits with polar functions behave very, very, very similarly as limits and regular old regular functions. Regular. Lots of regulars. It's like, it's like I own a restaurant. Lots of regulars. Oh, there you are. Hello, Mr. Calculator. We've missed you. All right. Graph the polar function in the calculator. I love these. These are going to be beautiful. Uh, find r of 1.5 pi. So let's graph that in our calculator and see what we get. So part one is to take this gross looking function and find out what 1.5 pi is. Well, before we can graph a polar graph, we have to make sure our calculator is set to polar. So click mode, go down the function and make sure it's polar like so. Then what we're going to do is we're going to hit Y equals and we're going to type out this thing right here, five. Now this is where it gets crazy. So bear with me here. There's no sine squared button. So this is how we're going to do it. We're going to wrap sine in parentheses, so sine theta, completely close it, and then square that. That is the same as sine squared theta. Minus 3, do the same thing for cosine. So wrap it in parentheses, cos theta. Make sure you close the whole thing, so double up the parentheses, square that as well. And then plus 1. Now, let's hit graph and see what we get. Ooh, if you needed to zoom in, you could, uh, but I kind of like what we have. Let's leave it like that. Uh, let's leave it just like that. My job for part A is to find out 1.5 pi. So let's do second calc and type out the value. If you're like, what are those? What are those? Calculus, you'll find out next year. Just hit value. And we're doing 1.5 pi. Second caret gives me pi. Hit enter. And we have 6. Oh, it's actually negative 6. Negative 6. All right, so negative 6. Negative 6. Find the average rate of change on the interval 0.75 pi minus 1.25 pi. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to find the values of R of 1.25 pi minus R of 0.75 pi, right? And then we're going to put that over uh, 1.25 two five pi minus uh, 0.75 pi. So I don't know what the answer is yet. Whatever this is, whatever gross number that ends up being is going to be over 0.5 pi. So let's see what happens. All right, so let's find the average rate of change of 0.7 pi and 1.25 pi. So we already did the part on the bottom. Let's do the part on the top. Uh, let's do the second thing that we did here and calculate the value of 1.25 pi. And we get negative 1.414214. So let's quit out of this and type that out. Negative 1.414. And then I'll hit minus and I'll do the other part when I get back to it. Let's go back here and calculate value. 
Now I'm going to do 1.25 pi. Enter. <gasps> no way. It's the same. It's the same. So since it's the same, I'm going to get zero up top. Zero over anything is zero. Oh, it's zero. The answer is zero. And it's zero. Uh, graph the function. Is it the same thing? I just want to show it off. Okay. So graph the function on the graphing calculator. So um, I already did. So I'll probably take a screenshot of the uh, graph and just show it here on the screen. And I'm going to have it right there. And I'm going to talk about it and say, wow, isn't that a cool picture? What a really cool picture that is. That picture right there. What a neat picture. It's like a weird deformed windmill type picture, but isn't it such a pretty picture? It is. And speaking of pretty picture, that's what you guys are to me, pretty and pictures. But uh, this is the end of unit three. Is why I sang that song at the very beginning. Uh, so we're done. We're done unit three. Uh, good luck. At this stage, you should be, if you've watched all of my videos, you should be adequately prepared for the AP pre-calculus exam, whenever that is for you, probably sometime in May, unless it's a different year and the world has changed drastically. I mean, we just had COVID, so you never know. But uh, thanks for watching my videos and good luck. Good luck. Love you. Mm, bye.